When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, Unshaken Saints. I'm Jared Halverson. Glad to be back with you. Actually, I have mixed feelings about being back with you. On the positive side, I'm always grateful we get to spend time in the scriptures together. And today we have two amazing revelations to study, section 135 and 136. But 135 is on the negative side because this is the eulogy that John Taylor writes for the prophet Joseph Smith after the martyrdom. And so that's the, the negative side of my mixed feelings, that having to teach this today means that we have reached the end of Joseph Smith's life and I just am sad to see him go. I remember the first year I taught seminary Book of Mormon, and I fell in love with Lehi. Uh, just the things that he taught, what he went through, I, I'd never spent so much time with him. And I remember going to, to class the day that we were going to be teaching the first chapters of Second Nephi, including the death of Lehi. And I didn't want to do it. I felt like I was an accomplice to the, to the crime. That if I didn't teach that day, then, then maybe somehow Lehi would go on living. Uh, but sure enough, I had to teach it, and it was... It was just devastating for me to realize that my time with him, scripturally speaking, in the Book of Mormon had come to an end. Uh, it hit me that, well, I'll put it this way, Lehi has never survived a reading of the Book of Mormon. He, he always dies there at the beginning of 2 Nephi. Uh, so to me at the time, I thought, why is this so troubling as opposed to previous times reading the Book of Mormon? And it dawned on me that unlike previous readings, Lehi had come to life for me. And we typically don't mourn the death of someone who had never come to life for us to begin with. I pray that Joseph Smith has come to life for you more this year than he has in, in previous times. Uh, I hope that by studying the words that the Lord revealed through him in the Doctrine and Covenants, it's been an opportunity for you to come to know the prophet Joseph Smith. When I was in sixth grade, it was the first time that our my, my elementary school English teacher uh, was, was willing to let us choose the books we wanted to read for book reports. And, uh, and so what's a sixth grader going to do? Of course, I picked the history of Joseph Smith by his mother, uh, Lucy Mack Smith. I just wanted to teach and testify of the Restoration to my little elementary school class uh, there in, in Los Angeles County. It was, it was, to me, a thrill to be able to just learn about him from someone who knew him so well, namely his mom. Uh, and ever since, I have been fascinated by the life and the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. In fact, in 2005, it was the 200 year anniversary, the bicentennial of the birth of the prophet. And the church was doing all kinds of things to commemorate that event. And I thought, well, what am I gonna do to commemorate it? And I decided as the year began, I've got 12 months ahead of me in 2005. What if I read a book about Joseph Smith each month for this year? And so I did a ton of reading that year, uh, but big books and small books and everything in between and books that, pro that praised Joseph Smith and books that attacked Joseph Smith. I, I was just trying to, to, un to wrap my mind and heart uh, around his history, his background, his, his contribution and so on. Uh, I still remember as November ended and my 11th book finished and I, and I was just wondering, okay, I've got one more book to read. Uh, what, what should I add to my, to my library? And I just had a very clear impression as I was pondering that. You know the book you should read if you really want to come to understand Joseph Smith. And it was the Book of Mormon. So that year uh, in December, I reread the Book of Mormon that month and again had confirmed to me, as has happened so many times before and since, that Joseph Smith truly was a prophet of God. I could have done the same with the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, maybe I should have done that in November. Uh, but to, to spend this year on the Doctrine and Covenants, like I said, I hope the prophet has come to life for you. Which, unfortunately, if he has, will make today all the harder. Because today we have to lay him to rest as we study section 135. I'm hoping that Josiah Quincy can help us set the stage today. He was the uh, congressman, he was the mayor of Boston, he was the president of Harvard University, and he, his life overlapped with the life of Joseph Smith. He's the one that's most famous among Latter-day Saints for saying 
that perhaps in some future day, in textbooks, if they ask the question, which 19th century American had the greatest effect upon his countrymen, it might not be surprising then, even though it is right now, that the answer to that question just might be Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. Uh, he's, he's very well known in LDS circles for that statement. Less well known is this statement by Josiah Quincy. The man who established a religion in this age of free debate and was and is today accepted by hundreds of thousands as a direct emissary from the Most High. Today we could add millions and millions. Such a rare human being is not to be disposed of by pelting his memory with unsavory epithets. Fanatic, imposter, charlatan, he may have been, but these hard names furnish no solution to the problem he presents to us. Fanatics and imposters are living and dying every day, and their memory is buried with them. But the wonderful influence which this founder of a religion exerted and still exerts throws him into relief before us, not as a rogue to be criminated, but as a phenomenon to be explained. Who was this phenomenal character? Joseph Smith. People have been scratching their heads and wondering about that ever since. Where you see non-Latter-day Saint, not even, even non-religious historians, just thinking that there's something about him that we have to account for. Why the resonance of the doctrine that he taught? Why, whence came the, the, the charisma, if you want to even call it that, that drew so many people, far better educated than he even, to come to follow him, to engage in the work with him? One Yale scholar called Joseph Smith the, a, a genius and, and perhaps the greatest example of a religion-making imagination of anyone in American history. Uh, I, don't, I don't care for the religion-making imagination part, but I do agree with the genius. Uh, actually, I don't even know if I agree with the genius. I, I, to me, it is mere, mere inspiration that he is a prophet called of God. And to do all that he did despite the, the ceaseless persecution that he faced throughout his life, from even before the first vision, all the way up to Carthage. Brigham Young was once speaking on Temple Square in Salt Lake City and talking about the old days with Joseph Smith. And he said that Joseph passed a short life of sorrow and trouble, surrounded by enemies who sought day and night to destroy him. If a thousand hounds were on this temple block, let loose on one rabbit, it would not be a bad illustration of the situation at times of the prophet Joseph. He was hunted unremittingly. And as we've seen, as we've studied the Doctrine and Covenants this year, in many ways, Joseph would have seen it coming. I, I've sometimes described this as the long road to Carthage that begins almost with the beginning of the Doctrine and Covenants itself. Way back in section five, he was told, and if you do this, behold, I grant unto you eternal life, even if you should be slain. Bummer last phrase there. It's like, what, 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 did you, what did you say? Did you have to throw that in? That I'll receive eternal life. You could have stopped there and it's like, oh, wonderful. But instead, yeah, even if they kill you. So there is some foreshadowing a decade and a half before this happened. Or the very next revelation of the Doctrine and Covenants, section six. For they can do no more unto you than unto me. <laughs> Which I always think, was that supposed to make Joseph feel better? It's like, wait a minute, they crucified you. It's like, yeah, but I'm resurrected. It was fine. Yeah, don't worry about those that can only harm the body. Worry about those that harm the soul. Jesus taught that in the New Testament, right? So here's Joseph Smith hearing this from the Lord like, whoa, okay, I'm supposed to be reassured by that. The verse goes on, and if they do unto you, even as they have done unto me, blessed are ye, for ye shall dwell with me in glory. Well, today, as we study section 135, we will see that they did do to him what they did to Jesus, that his is a martyr's crown. And although we, that, that there is no comparison to the death of Jesus, which brought salvation to us all, there, is, there are interesting historical parallels that we'll see as far as Joseph going as a lamb to the slaughter, as far as Joseph being betrayed by those that were closest to him. Joseph Smith followed Jesus through his life and followed Jesus even in his death. Way back in section 24, the Lord tells him, Be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many, but endure them. For lo, I am with thee, even unto the end of thy days. And we will see that companionship with Christ as we join Joseph in Carthage. 
with so many foreshadowings and, and subtly dropped hints from the very beginning of the Doctrine and Covenants, you can get a sense that Joseph would, would see certain, certain futures ahead. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily take the gift of prophecy itself to know that your life is constantly in danger and probably won't end well. In fact, in 1840, Joseph receives a blessing from his father that promises him, you shall even live to finish your work. And with that, Joseph cried out and began weeping. He said, oh, my father, shall I? Yes, said his father. You shall live to lay out the plan of all the work which God has given you to do. This is my dying blessing on your head in the name of Jesus. Now, Joseph worked, in fact, uh, Truman G. Madsen once described the last few months of Joseph's life as a man who was living on borrowed time. If you remember in the Liberty Jail Revelations, this is the spring of 1839. The Lord promises him, your days are known and your years will not be numbered less. Now, during that time, even Joseph was talking to others thinking, I don't, I'm not going to live to see age 40. At the time, he thought he's mentioned to several, I, I maybe have five more years to live. And again, if thy, if thy years are no, will not be numbered less, and if five was kind of that golden number in the spring of 1839, well, by the spring of 1844, no wonder Joseph's serving and working and, and, and pushing like a man living on borrowed time. By the summer of 1844, just after that five-year mark after, after Liberty Jail, Joseph is in another jail, Carthage, from which he will not leave alive. Now, kind of like Abinadi, Joseph knew that he couldn't be taken before his work was done. Wilfred Woodruff wrote in his journal in 1843 that Joseph had told him, I understand my mission and business. God Almighty is my shield. And what can man do if God is my friend? I shall not be sacrificed until my time comes. Then I shall be offered freely. Notice the language. Sacrificed, offered this is how Joseph is perceiving the kind of, of offering he is giving the Lord in his life as well as in his death. But he knew that offering wouldn't take place until he had given all that he had to as far as his mortal mission was concerned. A little bit earlier, he had said, some have supposed that Brother Joseph could not die. And he'd gotten out of prison or out of scrapes or out of persecution so many times before that you can understand why they would think that. But he went on, this is a mistake. It is true, there have been times when I have had the promise of my life to accomplish such and such things. But, having now accomplished those things, I have not at present any lease of my life. I am as liable to die as other men. By that fateful summer of 1844, Joseph had already revealed the endowment. That was a, that was a huge responsibility to be able to, to restore that ordinance to the earth. And perhaps just as importantly, he had conferred upon the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles every right, every privilege, every priesthood key that he possessed. Uh, and even told them that the time was, that the responsibility was now upon their shoulders. That they needed to round up those shoulders and bear off the kingdom triumphant. Because God was going to allow him to rest a while. Makes you wonder how the apostles felt when he told them that. At one point Brigham Young said, Though he had prophesied that he would not live to be 40 years of age, yet we all cherished hopes that that would be a false prophecy and we should keep him forever with us. We thought our faith would outreach it. Interesting, those who, who knew him to be a true prophet hoped he would, was a false prophet in that instance. They wanted to will him into long life, but that was not the plan. As we'll see today in section 135, Joseph was meant to seal his testimony with his life's blood. Now, the history leading up to Carthage is a fascinating one. Uh, legally and historically and everything that Joseph did politically with Governor Ford of, of Illinois and the Carthage Grays and Thomas Sharp and the Warsaw Signal and, and the Higbees and the Fosters and the Laws and those that were that seceding from the church to create their own little remnant organization and, and fighting Joseph Smith tooth and nail. I've noticed, on, well, I've known this for a long time. There are so many wonderful Come Follow Me channels out there. Yeah, I'm honored that you would include me in the lineup. Yeah, I know many of the, the men and women that, that make these channels, and we all, we're all friends, and we consider each other an online faculty yeah, that we're just trying to help bless the, bless the members of the church wherever, wherever you are. We hope that you find people that you can resonate with. 
Uh, this week's been crazy busy like normal, uh, and uh, but I did, as my commutes, have the chance to listen to a lot of other uh, channels that have already spoken about this, and their history is awesome. So I'm going to, to not uh, reinvent the wheel on that, and instead want to do the things that I think I'm, that I can contribute. Namely, a verse-by-verse -verse study of the texts of these revelations, 135 and then later 136. But also, based on my background in studying anti-religious rhetoric, I do want to spend a few, a few minutes talking about the Nauvoo Expositor. This one issue, probably the most famous newspaper ever written that only had one issue. Uh, and it was, it was uh, published by apostates that had been very close to Joseph Smith, including William Law, who was a member of the First Presidency. But they were trying to expose Joseph, hence the title, the Nauvoo Expositor. Uh, only one edition on June 7th, 1844. And yes, I've read the whole edition. Uh, it's interesting the kinds of things that it accuses Joseph of, of teaching vicious principles, of practicing whoredoms, of advocating spiritual wifery, and that's what John C. Bennett called what he was doing, uh, a sad counterfeit from, from plural marriage, which we talked about a few weeks ago. Grasping for political power, there's this threat of theocracy in Nauvoo of preaching that there were more, that there were many gods. There's a hint at the, at the King Follett discourse, explaining who God is and who we are and how, we, how the two relate. The newspaper charged Joseph of blaspheming against God, of promoting an inquisition in Nauvoo. And among other things, perhaps its most dangerous threat was its working against the Nauvoo Charter in hopes that it would be repealed. And it was the Nauvoo Charter, really, that it was the only thing that was keeping Illinois from turning into Missouri all over again, uh, that allowed Joseph uh, and the saints to, to create the Nauvoo Legion, for example, which was a massive force. In fact, at its peak, there were 2,500 soldiers. In 1845, the entire U.S. Army only had 8,500 soldiers. So uh, a little less than a third of the U.S. Army uh, and there you have this Nauvoo Legion, uh, trying to protect the saints from the threats all around them, the kind of threats that they faced in being driven out under extermination order uh, from Missouri. By the way, the fact that the Nauvoo Legion did nothing to retaliate after the martyrdom, to me, is one of the great examples of restraint that you'll see in American history. I mean, the people in Carthage skipped town after the martyrdom. Yeah, uh, a great book, if you want to read it, is written by a young lawyer named Dallin H. Oaks <laughs> called Carthage Conspiracy. And he goes through the aftermath of the martyrdom and sees from a legal standpoint the, the trial of the assassins, uh, none of which were brought to justice, uh, is a travesty of law. Uh, and a legal mind like Dallin H. Oaks walks you through it. But again, part of that aftermath, the fact that the, the Nauvoo Legion did nothing, is really, really amazing. They could have leveled the state if they'd wanted to. But back to the Nauvoo Expositor. That, in many ways, was the, the straw that broke the camel's back and that finally precipitated the, the legal action, or illegal action as the case was, uh, from the state of Illinois to bring Joseph Smith to justice. Uh, because after this, this one edition went forth, Joseph Smith, as mayor of Nauvoo, and the city council voted that it was a public nuisance, that it was going to lead to major social disorder, uh, people up in arms once they're reading these inflammatory rhetoric, uh, that Nauvoo would be endangered by people all around in, in surrounding uh, communities. And so they voted to destroy the press, to put an end to this Nauvoo expositor. Now, in some ways, it's that, that's shocking to think, well, First Amendment, freedom of the press. And yet, as Elder Oaks has pointed out, that there was legal precedent for that. Uh, they probably went too far in terms of destroying the press, but in terms of ending the publication of this public nuisance, there was, there was precedent for that. And from a personal level, you think about W.W. Phelps, as his press is destroyed and his, scat his type is scattered back in independence. So the saints had been on the receiving end of this as well. They're taking all of that seriously, taking it all, the legal ramifications under consideration too, but feeling that it was legal what they were doing. Uh, and again, that would have been backed up in a court of law at the time, but not so much the court of public opinion. So Governor Ford rushes in and brings Joseph and, and Hiram uh, to, to Carthage where they could stand trial, probably assuming that no trial would actually take place. He had promised Joseph, uh, I'll, I'll, when I go back to Nauvoo, I'll bring you with me, you're, you're under state protection. 
But then when Ford left without Joseph, he was basically washing his hands Pilate style. Uh, he actually compared himself to Pilate later, uh, or at least feared that people would do exactly that. Uh, and, and Joseph and, and Hiram were then, were then killed without protection. They were supposed to be protected by the Carthage Greys. But talk about asking the cat to protect the mice. Mm, yeah, I, I, they knew exactly what was going to take place then. And like I said, I'm not going to revisit the history, as fascinating as it is. There are wonderful videos that are out there that you can watch to see kind of step by step what took place to get to Carthage. But please let me give you a few th insights into the Nauvoo Expositor, uh, since that, that's the thing that has fascinated me. Rhetorically speaking, how can we say things in such a way that will, will get people up in arms, literally, uh, and eventually lead to the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram? Now, the irony here is... A complaint I sometimes hear from people to this day that when they say, wait, you say you study anti-Mormonism, but so much of the stuff that you're talking about isn't anti-Mormonism, it's plain old Mormonism. Why would you call it anti when it's just the history of the church? And, and to me, it's like, well, careful. Anti doesn't just mean content. Anti can be tone. It can be intent. It can be rhetoric. It can be what you're choosing to include and what you're choosing not to. It can be the audience or the timing, kind of milk before meat, and it can be how contextualized is it versus decontextualized to make things look as bad as possible. I've said this before, the three S's of anti-religious rhetoric are the sensational, the superficial, and the selective. And as I have studied the Nauvoo Expositor, it's guilty of all three. It does sensationalize the kinds of things that are taking place in Nauvoo. Again, those that want to defend the Nauvoo Expositor, and say, it was true. What it was accusing Joseph Smith of, well, there's polygamy. He did teach the King Follett discourse. Uh, there, it is a, a kind of kingdom on the Mississippi. Uh, there's a council of 50 that he's created. That, that is, he's running for president of the United States. There's, there's so many things that if you look at it at surface level, you can think, well, there, was there anything technically false about the Nauvoo Expositor? Well, again, it depends on how you're framing things, and particularly how the writers of the Nauvoo Expositor were framing the things that they were describing about Joseph Smith. So when it comes to the anti side of things, look beyond mere content and notice how it is presented. It is sensationalized, it is superficial, and it is very selective in what it is saying. Spinning things in such a way that people, like I said, are literally up in arms against the prophet. So here's a few things about the the Nauvoo Expositor. One is that they repeat these claims of objectivity. And I see that today uh, in, in podcasts and things that are, that are meant to attack the church. Uh, let's, let's get some, some supposedly objective scholars on board. Or let's get some former Latter-day Saints that never intended to be former. And that way we can establish their, their credentials and get some street cred among other believing Latter-day Saints that, wow, they believed just like I do. Uh, that, that they were AP on their mission, whatever it might be. Uh, and, and yet somehow they learned these things and, and there was no choice but to leave the church out of intellectual honesty. I, I hear that all the time. Uh, and... And to see the, the, the writers of the Nauvoo Expositor doing similar things. I mean, after all, nobody knows Mormonism quite like we Mormons, they, they said. Uh, nobody is, is more familiar with what Joseph Smith is up to than those of us that were serving right alongside him up to this point. In the Expositor, they denied that they had any private feelings to gratify or any private peak to settle, which was simply not the case. Now, I don't mean to malign William Law, for example. Uh, there may have been some, some positive motivation on his side to save the church. He had been in the First Presidency, after all. He and Joseph had been close. Uh, there was m so much conflict over the, the revelation of plural marriage. That was one that, that William simply could not wrap his head around. There's some evidence that he may have been unfaithful to his wife at some point in their marriage. And perhaps there was that, that sense of guilt from past transgression that colored his perception of even within marriage, this is not adultery, as we studied in section 132. Uh, but even that, was it a, too much of a gut, gut punch for him and for his wife? And, 
and we cannot, we will not do this. In fact, we will expose you, Joseph, through this expositor, if this is what you're trying to do. And again, Joseph caught between this rock and a hard place of how do I, how do I do, make an Abrahamic sacrifice when, the, when public opinion will be so pronounced against me uh, that this has to be kept on the down low. Uh, th this is, again, Joseph was put in an impossible situation. In some ways, perhaps William Law was too. But again, where he took it in slandering the prophet with such inflammatory rhetoric, oh, the, in, in many ways, they are just as guilty of Joseph's martyrdom as the, as the mob in Carthage that pulled the triggers. And yet, like I said, uh, denying any personal feelings involved in the matter. We are simply being unbiased, unprejudiced, uh, objective in our reporting. Simply not true. Uh, later they said that we were following the laws of editorial courtesy, which as we'll see in a moment was anything but the truth. But they reserve the right to use such terms and names as they deem proper when the object is of such high importance that the end will justify the means. This was actually a, a common tactic in that time period uh, where it was so much just the kind of rhetoric they used in newspapers, whether this was anti-religious rhetoric or simply political rhetoric, there was a certain sense of we need to be above the kind of mudslinging that other people would be guilty of. But then again, of course, if, if people deserve it, then I, I'm not being mean-spirited. I'm simply being honest. Uh, the ends justify the means here. And so, so we're trying to keep the public peace, then, then riling them up to war just about, eh, it, it's justifiable. There's, there's a word called apophatic rhetoric, and, and apophatic rhetoric is, is saying something in the process of not saying something. It, it's, in other words, I, I'm going to drop a hint even as I deny that I'm dropping one. You could say something like, well, I would never call you a liar, but the things that you've said, and, and again, oh, I would never call you a liar, you just did. You just hinted at this. And so, oh, far be it from me to bring up A, B, and C. Well, you just brought up A, B, and C. And so that's another thing that's happening in the Nauvoo Expositor. We're not going to use any bad names unless they're, they're just so obviously deserved that we, that we can't help ourselves. We're, we're going to stay above this. Uh, but since Joseph Smith is so, so beneath us and beneath the level of, of editorial courtesy, uh, we might say a few things here and there that might sound a little harsh. P oh, please forgive us. We, we would never mean to, to do so. Along those lines, sometimes they simply leave things to the imagination of their readers. For example, when they're talking about spiritual wifery and not putting it into the kind of context that section 132 does, threats of, of eternal damnation if you don't succumb to our entreaties to, to participate in these, in these licentious acts. At one point, the Nauvoo Expositor says, it can't even describe the wretchedness of females in this place without wounding the feelings of the benevolent or shocking the delicacy of the refined. See how it's paying compliments to its readers? Oh, you're, you're far too benevolent to, to want to hear what's really happening here. You're far too refined. Oh, it would be, it would be offensive to your delicate ears. So just let your mind wander. Okay, you just go ahead and imagine, picture what the wretchedness of this of female existence must be like in Nauvoo, rather than actually going and talking with Eliza R. Snow, for example. I mean, that's the irony of the anti-polygamy legislation. And when they really wanted to give Latter-day Saint women the right to vote, uh, in in hopes that they, then they'd just they'd free themselves from plural marriage. Well, that didn't turn out quite the way they'd envisioned, since the the women then said, "Great, thank you for giving us a voice." we are now going to raise it in defense of a practice we consider part of our religion. That, the boy, did that backfire <laughs> on the Eastern press or the Eastern politicians. But you see where they're coming from. It's like, well, we've been left to our own imagination, the kind of horrific existence that the women of Utah must be enduring. Same kind of thing here for Nauvoo. In fact, even before the newspaper gets to the, the anti-Mormon kind of expose, it's so, I mean, it, it, they intend it to be a regular newspaper. And, and what sells copy? Well, Hollywood knows it well, the sensational, right? Sex and violence, and they're gonna talk about all of that in context of what old Joe Smith is doing in Nauvoo. But it's funny that the way the newspaper begins, 
It has some poetry and it has, it even has some jokes. They're, they're not very funny. Uh, it's, it starts with this, this love story about these two men that are fighting over the same lover and then it ends in a murder-suicide. So you get this sense, of, this sense of sensationalism that we're just trying to sell copy and we want people to kind of be drawn in. And especially by, by planting these seeds of the murder-suicide and, the, and the, the fighting over a lover and, oh, that's exactly what's happening in Nauvoo. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But even there, you see something that I've noticed running throughout anti-religious rhetoric. And that's the, in fact, last year in the Book of Mormon, we talked about this when we studied Korahor in Alma chapter 30. And it's the, the idea that, that simultaneously you maximize and minimize what your enemy is doing. Uh, we talked about blaming and belittling with, with Korahor, uh, of making the, the, the church out to be this enemy that was so restrictive and they're yoking people under, under this weight. And, and at the same time though, it's so foolish. It's the silly traditions of your fathers. It's amazing throughout scripture, especially whenever you see somebody being persecuted, it happens, it, it's, it's happening on two, on two levels kind of sounding on two different registers. There's the, the, the maximize, the blame, make, that, make the enemy out to be this, this sinister power that you have to take seriously or they will destroy you. But simultaneously, minimize it, belittle them, make it out to seem like something so inherently laughable that you don't even have to give it a second thought. Just laugh and move on. Now, which one is it? Actually, a lot of racist propaganda has used the same kind of thing. So much anti-Semitism throughout time has made Judaism or made Jews look simultaneously so beneath anyone's concern, so laughably absurd. But at the same time, oh, they're taking over Hollywood and Wall Street and they're running the world behind the scenes and we have to be, whoa, which one is it? Are they, so, are they so stupid we don't have to take them seriously? Or are they so cunning that we have to be up in arms? And, and why do both at the same time? Probably because it's trying to push people in either direction. Out of this Goldilocks middle zone of, well, let's try to be calm and understand what is going on and see how we, how we feel about it. Let's let them be innocent until proven guilty. Oh, no, 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 we can't do that. I was talking to an institute class recently about what they see in the corner of their computer screen whenever it's open uh, that has a minimize button and a maximize button and a close button. And that's anti-religious rhetoric. Let's minimize it and just make fun of it. Uh, let's reduce it to the absurd. Or let's maximize it so it's so shock and awe in your face that you will, you will retaliate, you will fight against it. Either way, the ultimate goal is to close off conversation, to, to shut it down and just either dismiss or to demonize, but to get people to avoid actually thinking logically, calmly about the kinds of things that they're being told. The fact that Jesus would both be mocked and put a crown of thorns and a purple robe as if, oh, he's the king of kings, but then crucify him? Which one is he? Is he a laughing stock? Or, he is a or is he a traitor to the crown, uh, a threat to the empire? Oh, make up your mind. You'll see the same thing in Joseph Smith history as they, as they both uh, mock as well as persecute him. You see it throughout scripture and you see it in the Nauvoo Expositor as well. Telling jokes on the one hand to soften you up through humor and telling stories about sex and violence on the other to get you really concerned about things that might be going on in Nauvoo. It talked, the, the expositor talked about Joseph's follies as well as his iniquities. Those were two terms it used. Follies on the minimum side, uh, or the minimized side, and, and iniquities on the maximized side. And again, all coming from well-meaning, honest, uh, non-inflammatory editors and writers that are simply telling things as they really are. Uh, not quite. Let me give you a few examples. On the minimized side, they said that Smith's teachings were too gross a burlesque upon common sense to be taken seriously. Instead, they should be held up to public scorn. So we're just going to make fun of it. At one point, they called Joseph the self-constituted monarch. Again, kind of crown of thorns on him, too. We're just going to make fun of him. He, he, think, he thinks he's the king of, the, of, of Nauvoo, this little kingdom on the Mississippi. Can you believe that? They accused him of feigning to be a god. 
There's the King Follett discourse. But, but packaged, framed, spun in such a way that like, can you believe this guy? Not enough to think he's the king. I mean, he's already been called the Mormon Muhammad. He's already been called the Mormon Pope by other writers. Well, now <laughs> he's the Mormon king uh, and he's the Mormon God. Can you believe that? They called his attempts at political power. I mean, here's a farm boy that's running for president. Was well, that that much different than Andrew Jackson, for example? Anyway, they called it preposterous and absurd. There's the reducing to the absurd. They said that Joseph expects by a flourish of quixotic chivalry to take by storm the presidential chair. So there's Don Quixote, which was like the most often used example of just making fun of somebody. Here's the, the knight of the woeful countenance. There he is fighting windmills. The guy is, is clinically insane. You're not going to take him seriously, are you? No, we should just lock him up somewhere. Uh, commit him to some asylum because he's obviously... Uh, crazy, riding around the Illinois countryside looking for windmills to fight. So with this mental image of Don Quixote on his, on his noble steed, Rocinante, uh, they're going to make fun of Joseph's run for the presidency. They said they intended to treat Smith's campaign, quote, with a little levity and nothing more, close quote. But boy, did they treat it with something more. Because if that kind of language was, was for the minimized side, what about the maximized side? Because again, if we, if we leave it at that, and he's just some Don Quixote, then fine, lock him up. The insane aren't public dangers. Uh, in some ways, they're simply public laughing stocks. So leave it at that. But no, that's not enough for the, for the Laws and the Fosters and the Higbees. It's not enough for the Carthage Greys. It's not enough for the enemies of the church. And so what is the Nauvoo Expositor going to, going to provide them with incredible justification for for locking them in a prison rather than an asylum and subjecting them to the butt of guns rather than the butt of jokes, uh, to, to fire real ammunition, sticks and stones, not just words. And how do they do that? They describe Joseph Smith's merging of church and state as having for its object the utter destruction of the rights of the old citizens of the county. Now, if you're one of the old citizens of the county and you hear this from a Latter-day Saint themselves, what, this was one of Joseph's right-hand men? And he's saying that, that Joseph is trying to get it to a point where he's going to usurp all power and authority over us? We've got to be up in arms. This is no mere Don Quixote. This is the Spanish Inquisition, and we have to fight it tooth and nail. The Nauvoo Expositor took Joseph's teachings about, about God and called them heretical and damnable. They described them as vicious and called the doctrine of many gods a blasphemy. That wasn't just blasphemous in and of itself, but it's, it, they called it one of the most direful in its effects that has characterized the world for many centuries. Now talk about hyperbole. The, the thought, and again, many gods, they capitalize it. Joseph in section 132 keeps it uh, lowercase every time, that we are becoming like our father in heaven. We're not usurping his throne. Uh, he's quoting the scripture the way Jesus quotes scripture when they're freaking out about Jesus claiming that that we're anything that he was anything more than a mere man and Jesus quotes Psalms 82 that says but ye are gods and children of the most high lowercase g we're already gods so me calling myself the son of God what's the big deal about that well Joseph was doing similar things but the Nauvoo expositor no this is the most direful effects the consequences of this kind of blasphemy Oh, it'll bring down the kingdom. It'll bring down the world. Really? I mean, Lorenzo Snow, who was so fascinated and, and inspired by the thought that we can become like God, said it, quoting a, a, a verse from the, the letters of John, this is what makes us want to purify ourselves even as he is pure. That thoughts of humanity's divine potential are meant to inspire us to goodness, to purity, to discipleship, not to some kind of Oh, ousting God from his kingdom. But forget Joseph's teachings alone. Let's go straight for the prophet himself, straight for the man. Let's do some character assassination in hopes that it just might lead to some literal assassination later on, which it did. So what does the Nauvoo Expositor say about Joseph? It calls him pernicious and diabolical. Ooh, the devil himself. It calls him wicked and corrupt. It claimed that Joseph was turning men into beasts and called him and his fellow church leaders heaven-daring, hell-deserving, God-forsaken villains. 
even demons in human shape. How's that for editorial courtesy, huh? How's that for avoiding naming names or, or saying anything that's, that's angry? Uh, unless the ends justify the means. And oh, believe me, these, these ends definitely justify these means. The newspaper mentioned the dark ages of popery, when bigotry, superstition, and tyranny held universal sway over the empire of reason. How's that for leveraging anti-Catholicism? That's where popery is, right? The Pope? Uh, to, to use that which was so common in Protestant America at the time. Uh, in the 1830s, a, a convent had been burned to the ground in, in Boston. So much anti-Catholicism at the time. So if we can paint Joseph, not just as a, a crazy Don Quixote, but as a power-hungry pope right here on the American frontier, then of course uh, anti-Catholic Protestants are going to be up in arms against him. They said that Joseph had an inquisitorial department that was even worse than the Spanish Inquisition. They said it was of the most pernicious and diabolical character that ever stained the pages of the historian. Really? Worse than anything you'd ever seen in history? And this is supposed to be just objective uh, newspaper reporting? Of anything but that. It described that what was happening in Nauvoo as the most dark and damnable crimes that ever darkened human character. There's some more hyperbole for you. It called Joseph Smith a sycophant whose attempt for power find no parallel in history. It called him one of the blackest and basest scoundrels that has appeared upon the stage of human existence since the days of Nero and Caligula. Whew, wow. Uh, if that's not blowing things out of proportion, I don't know what is. How's this one? It said that Smith was spreading death, devastation, and ruin throughout your happy country like a tornado. See, now they're, they're speaking directly to their, to their readers. And it, earlier when it talked about uh, ousting the old inhabitants of the county, now it's talking about the country. I had to double check to make sure that, <laughs> that the R was there. And, and yes, that the country, your country, so you've got to come to your own defense and come on the offense against this Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Along those lines, the expositor warned of warfare. It asked its Mormon readers, will you bring a mob upon us? And then warned that they, the writers of the expositor, and the like-minded citizens all around them, would be among the first to put down anything like an illegal force being used against any man or set of men. It went on, let no man or set of men assail us at the peril of their lives. So now this really is stoking the flames, the fires of opposition here. You attack us, oh, that's going to be at the peril of your own life. And we hereby give notice to all parties that we are the last in attack, but the first and foremost in defense. See again how they're turning the tables? That it's the Latter-day Saints that are the, the real aggressor here. We're simply trying to defend ourselves and our rights and our liberties. The newspaper said, we would be among the last to provoke the spirit of the public abroad unnecessarily. Oh, of course, we're, we're not trying to do anything that, like that with our inflammatory rhetoric. But we have abundant assurance in case of emergency that we shall all be there. And that's what happened in Carthage. They were all there, ready to fight. I mean, it's, the Nauvoo Expositor wasn't that far from the kinds of inflammatory rhetoric you read from Thomas Sharp at the Warsaw Signal. And boy, was he an anti-Mormon. With an abundance of exclamation points and plenty of capitalization and bold print, the Warsaw Signal said around the same time period, war and extermination is inevitable, exclamation point. Citizens arise, one and all. Three exclamation points. Can you stand by and suffer such infernal devils, exclamation point, to rob men of their property and rights without avenging them? We have no time for comment. Every man will make his own. Let it be made with powder and ball. Three exclamation points. If that isn't inciting the public, I don't know what is. And like I said, it's not much more inflammatory than the kinds of things the Nauvoo Expositor itself was saying. For example, let the majesty of violated law and the voice of injured innocence and contemned public opinion speak in tones of thunder to these miscreants. Honestly, as I read the Nauvoo Expositor, I can't help but sustain the city council in deciding 
the effect of this kind of reporting could lead to mass devastation among the saints in Nauvoo. This is more than a public nuisance. This is a public danger. But the governor of Illinois, the people of, in the surrounding country, it was enough for them to feel convinced and justified that Joseph Smith needed to be brought out of Nauvoo, where he felt safe within the environment of his, of his kingdom, and brought to Carthage, where he could be exposed not only to the legalities of a court case, but to the illegalities of mob violence. Throughout it all, how does Joseph feel about his own reputation? He said, when I am called by the trump of the archangel and weighed in the balance, you will all know me then. I add no more. God bless you all. And eventually Joseph would saddle his horse and ride off eastward with Hiram, the two of them knowing that they were headed as lambs to the slaughter. And with that, I will let other historians walk you through that, that those events. And John Taylor, still recovering from the four bullets that he took in Carthage jail, writes, what has become a canonized eulogy for the prophet and the patriarch. Section 135, verse 1, to seal the testimony of this book and the Book of Mormon, we announce the martyrdom of Joseph Smith the prophet and Hiram Smith the patriarch. In that opening statement, even before Joseph Smith is named, we see the focus of his ministry, that it was a scriptural ministry, that to seal the testimony of this book the Doctrine and Covenants that we've been st studying for the last year almost, the Book of Mormon that we studied the year before and hopefully remains a part of our daily scripture study, to seal the testimony of those books of Restoration Scripture, we announce the martyrdom. Throughout this section, 135, you will see the place that Scripture holds in, in the ministry of Joseph Smith. You'll see the place that Scripture ought to hold within our own life's work, to, to put in perspective what we've been studying, that's why to me scripture means so much. It meant everything to Joseph. If you remember in 1 Nephi 5, when Nephi and his brothers go back to Jerusalem to get the brass plates, and then bring them back, and Father Lehi is so grateful to have them, and begins to search them from the beginning, and then finds them to be of great worth unto the children of men. Worth sending my sons back into harm's way. Worth almost getting killed by Laban, repeatedly, worth losing all of our fortune, worth any amount of sacrifice so we can preserve the voice of God in our journeyings through the wilderness toward our promised land. That's the, the sense that I get from that opening line of section 135. More than just what's the value of Joseph Smith and Hiram to the saints, it's what's the value of the scriptures to the, to the leaders of the church to prophets and patriarchs, to, to saints and, and disciples, to any of us, would we consider them of great worth unto the children of men? To the point that it is worth whatever self-sacrifice that we make, whether it's life and limb, as it was for Joseph and Hiram, or whether it's time and attention, serious study for each of the rest of us. They were shot in Carthage jail, the report goes on. On the 27th of June, 1844, about 5 o'clock p.m., by an armed mob, painted black, of from 150 to 200 persons. Very cool and collected reporting, I must say, compared to, to what we saw in the Nauvoo Expositor. But even to think of a mob of 150 to 200 persons, they painted themselves black in the aftermath of newspapers painting Joseph and his, his deeds, his teachings, his personality in the blackest of dye. But 150 to 200 to go fight a small, I mean, two prisoners and then two others that chose to stay with them, Willard Richards and John Taylor, was a, was a mob, an army of 200 really necessary? Honestly, it reminds me of Judas Iscariot bringing an army. The way the accounts in the New Testament describe it, it's, it's a, a multitude with torches and lanterns and weapons, with swords and staves. It makes you wonder, Judas, what were you expecting? Some kind of knockout, drag out fight in, in the shadows of Gethsemane? Because what did it end up being? No resistance. 
I mean, even when Peter rushes out to try to save Jesus and slices off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Jesus heals that ear and then surrenders himself. No, no opposition at all from him. Did you really need the multitude, Judas? 150 to 200 men? Well, the report goes on. Hiram was shot first and fell calmly. That's such a fascinating adverb. To be shot in the face, but to fall calmly, exclaiming, I am a dead man. Joseph then leaped from the window and was shot dead in the attempt, exclaiming, O Lord my God. Most historians describe that attempt, that leap from the window, as an effort to save the survivors in hopes that there would be any. Sure enough, uh, John Taylor, with four bullet holes, was able to roll underneath the bed and was hiding to be safe from the mob. And he survived. And then Willard Richards, the, the biggest target in the room that day, he was a very large man, had a bullet graze his ear, but not even a hole in his, in his raiment, as Joseph had prophesied of him earlier. But had Joseph stayed in that room in Carthage? As the mob is rushing up the stairs and fighting their way into the door, as, as other mobbers are outside shooting up through the window, had he stayed, would John Taylor have survived? Would Willard Richards have escaped unscathed? Most likely no. So this rush to the window, this, this attempt at not escaping himself, there was no way. I mean, when you're surrounded uh, and, and, and bullets flying at you from both directions, he knows there's no hope for him. But perhaps there's hope for others. Verse 1 ends, They were both shot after they were dead, in a brutal manner and both received four balls. By the way, that shooting has continued ever since, as people are still firing at the memory and the reputation of Joseph Smith. The angel Moroni had warned him as a 17-year-old kid, your name will be had for good and ill among all nations. They'll love you and they'll hate you. There's, you're such a polarizing figure because you are claiming prophetic gifts. You are declaring things as they really are. No wonder Joseph has been shot in brutal manners ever since he began to proclaim, O oh Lord my God, I know him. I know what he's like. I know what he wants for us. I know where we've come from and where, why we're here. I know where we're going. It was his relationship with the Lord his God that has led him to being shot literally and figuratively ever since. In verse 2, John Taylor and Willard Richards, two of the twelve, were the only persons in the room at the time. The former was wounded in a savage manner with four balls, but has since recovered. Now take that statement with a grain of salt, because John Taylor bore those wounds for the rest of his life. Recovering? Oh, how do you handle the PTSD of a situation like that? Or even as we'll see in a couple of weeks with the end of plural marriage, he was in hiding some people have called him uh, an additional martyr from Carthage. His demise simply took decades in, in coming. Then it ends, the latter, so now Willard Richards, through the providence of God, escaped without even a hole in his robe. And as I said, Joseph had prophesied to Willard Richards that such would be the case. Someday you and I will be together and the bullets will be flying around us like hailstones, but there will not be a hole in your robe. The reporting done, verse 3, then begins this eulogy. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord. And we usually think of prophet, seer, and revelator. Well, how did this section begin? Revealing this book of Doctrine and Covenants, revealing the truths of the Book of Mormon. So prophet, seer, and revelator. Has done more, save Jesus only, for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. Now, please don't lose sight of those three middle words, save Jesus only. I love and honor the prophet Joseph Smith, but I do not worship or adore him. For that, I, that I reserve to the Father and the Son. To understand what Jesus has done to make salvation available to all of God's children, that infinite redeeming reach. But second only to him was the work of that prophet who extended 
the, the Savior Jesus Christ, his redemption reaches infinitely. But to help people find their way to it, if they are only kept by the, from the truth by, because they know not where to find it, that what, then what was Joseph's mission? To make sure that all of God's children could find it, could find their way to Jesus Christ. And no one has done more than Joseph to do that. To be the head of a dispensation. Remember we talked about the Pearl of Great Price and it's it, the seven main figures in the Pearl of Great Price are the seven dispensation heads. And to see Joseph's role as the leader of the final dispensation, when more of God's children are living upon the earth than at any previous time period, and since it's the dispensation that gathers in one all things in Christ, then no wonder somebody has to tie up every loose end left from prior dispensations. And that is Joseph Smith. To think about missionary work that has never occurred on the scale that it does now in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. To see temple work being done. To gather Israel on the other side of the veil as well. None of that would be possible without the instrumentality of the prophet Joseph Smith. We talked about the hyperbole of the Nauvoo Expositor. This is not hyperbole from John Taylor. Joseph Smith and the restoration of the gospel through his instrumentality has extended the, the redeeming love of Jesus Christ and the saving ordinances of his gospel to more of God's children than at any other time in history. In fact, as John Taylor walks you through the rest of verse 3, there is the evidence that he is presenting. Exhibit A, Exhibit B, Exhibit C to justify the statement that he just made. Before we present that evidence, though, can I call one other witness to the stand? And that would be Joseph of Egypt. Back in 2 Nephi 3, when Lehi is teaching and blessing his youngest son, Joseph, he talks about three Josephs in that chapter. Joseph, his son, and then Joseph of Egypt, and then Joseph of Palmyra. Uh, fascinating passages there as he ties them all together. But in 2 Nephi 3.15, Joseph of Egypt makes this prophecy about this future seer. His name shall be called after me. So his name will be Joseph also. It shall be after the name of his father. So it will be a Joseph Jr. I've always wondered how Joseph Smith felt as he translates this passage. It's like, oh, his name's going to be Joseph. Interesting. Joseph Jr. <gasps> Whoa. Uh, okay. The Lord knows me. Well, Joseph of Egypt went on. He shall be like unto me. And there's amazing parallels between those two as far as saving their people and providing the bread of life so they can survive the famine in the land. Amazing parallels between those two Josephs. But then this statement, he shall be like unto me for the thing which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand, by the power of the Lord, shall bring my people unto salvation. I love that description. The thing, <laughs> it's a fun way to describe the restoration. What is it? What is that thing? Oh, it's tough to put words to. But it's a thing that will bring God's children to salvation. It will extend those blessings to every daughter and son of God that has ever lived. And how did he do it? Here's the evidence. In the short space of 20 years, which is an incredibly brief ministry, he has brought forth the Book of Mormon, which he translated by the gift and power of God, and has been the means of publishing it on two continents, Again, Joseph's was a scriptural ministry. At a time when the canon was decidedly closed, Joseph threw it open. He tore off the back page, the back cover of the Bible, and said, God wants to continue speaking. What's the first word of the Doctrine and Covenants? Hearken. God chooses to talk. What's the Book of Mormon about? A ministry among other sheep, not of the ancient fold, that would hear his voice and come to know him. That's the voice that, God is, that, that Joseph is restoring to the world. A father in heaven who loves his children enough to speak to them. He has sent the fullness of the everlasting gospel, which it, the Book of Mormon, contained, to the four quarters of the earth. Within the subsequent century, Christianity would begin reigning in its missionary endeavors. After 1,800 years of, of trying to preach the gospel in every nation, Within the, the 20th century, we see that decline. Fears of, of, oh, is this simply ecclesiastical imperialism? And so who are we to, to share the things that God has given us? Well, well, who are we? 
were the people God has commissioned to, to do just that. And Joseph began this missionary work even when we saw this back in, in Kirtland with apostasy all around him, rather than just hunker down and, and circle the wagons, it's no, send out missionaries and proclaim the everlasting gospel to the four quarters of the earth. He goes on, he has brought forth the revelations and commandments which compose this book of doctrine and covenants. So not just ancient scripture in the Book of Mormon, but modern revelation in the doctrine and covenants. Again, at a time when, when God was thought to be muzzled and they, they spoke of God speaking in the past tense, but no speaking in the present, Joseph restored to God his voice. And we hear it through these revelations. Joseph gave many other wise documents and instructions for the benefit of the children of men. Would that include the King Follett discourse, which the Nauvoo Expositor slams so mercilessly? Could that include the Book of Abraham, which is still picked apart by Egyptologists to this day, but the doctrine that is contained in it? I mean, do say what you will about the provenance. The doctrine that it contains is, is mind-blowing. Who else understands premortality better than we because of some of the wise documents and instructions that Joseph has given? And even beyond scripture, I mean, uh, city planning and how the city of Zion was supposed to look, how, how Nauvoo was built up. That, that, even when, when Brigham Young uh, built up Salt Lake City and other communities in the West, it was such a model of city planning. And for him, it was just, well, I just learned it from Joseph Smith back in Zion. Uh, to see his presidential platform that would have averted the Civil War and later politicians recognizing that as the, the war seemed unavoidable. So many things Joseph did and taught and built and left behind for the benefit of the children of men. Keep reading. He gathered many thousands of the Latter-day Saints. And from my 21st century perspective, at a time when society has been splintered across so many uncrossable lines, to think of a man who was able to gather many thousands of the Latter-day Saints, to bring them from diverse backgrounds and cultures and educational levels and social strata and bring them together in a common cause to establish Zion, which by definition is unified, one heart, one mind, dwelling in righteousness, no poor among us, to gather them together so they could build temples and to do it over and over and over again as those who are gathered are continually scattered by the, the circumstances they find themselves in, the enemies of the church all around. I mean, the next phrase where he founded a great city, he did that over and over and over again. The culmination was there in Nauvoo, complete with university and legion and industry and infrastructure and temple rising from the ground. It's incredible what Joseph Smith left. I mean, the New York Sun in 1843 said, it is no small thing in the blaze of this 19th century to give to men a new revelation, to found a new religion, to establish new forms of worship, to build a city with new laws, institutions, and orders of architecture, to establish ecclesiastic, civil, and military jurisdiction, found colleges, send out missionaries, make proselytes in two hemispheres. Yet all this has been done by Joe Smith, and that against every sort of opposition, ridicule, and persecution. To catch the ridicule and persecution, the minimize and maximize in order to close it down. Oh, they couldn't close it down. It's amazing what Joe Smith, even the way that, they, that enemies of the church that described him, that a person with the most common of names and the most common of backgrounds did the most uncommon of things. Yes, John Taylor, you are right that Joseph Smith left a fame and name that cannot be slain. He lived great and he died great in the eyes of God and his people. Those were, the, those were the two opinions that mattered to him, in that order, by the way. And like most of the Lord's anointed in ancient times, has sealed his mission and his works with his own blood. Now we would consider that martyr's blood and include with it a martyr's crown for Joseph and for Hiram that we'll see in just a moment. The interesting thing about martyrdom is it doesn't necessarily prove the truthfulness of the cause for which the person died. Because there, people have died for all kinds of causes throughout history. But it does prove that to the individual, that cause was worth living and dying for. 
we have to we have to wrestle with the kind of statement Joseph Smith was making by going to Carthage and making his life a sacrifice or an offering to something he believed wholeheartedly was true. That doesn't force his belief upon us, but it should cause us to pause and consider. At least give, give Joseph the benefit of, of our doubt and honor his faith in the cause he was living and dying for. With that, hopefully, we can get past the minimization and maximization of those that are trying to attack him to suspend disbelief long enough to at least give him a chance to explain himself. If he was willing to die for this, can I at least hear where he's coming from? That's my hope for people. Honest people, wherever they might be, can you at least give Joseph a chance to explain himself? Back in section 128 when he said that, that the deep water was what he was wont to swim in, that persecution and opposition has been his common lot all of the days of his life. That was 127, not 128. Uh, to understand what he was, just give me a chance to explain myself. I'll let you judge for yourself. He says that in, in that same section. But let him do that. His martyrdom at least gives us, or ought to give him, the chance to do just that. So I love what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, don't be alarmed. <laughs> that doesn't mean that every contract you sign, every time you put your name on the dotted line, means that you're going to have to pay a martyr's price to defend it. No, it simply means that as long as you're alive, you could change your old contracts. You could renegotiate. You could rescind. You could say, I'm sorry, I, I don't agree with my old self. But, but at death, then there's, there's nothing that can change that. If you're willing to hold on to that, even, that's even why we, when we sign wills, it's like my last will and testament. Being of sound mind and body, okay? I, I could change this right now if I intended to. I'm sound enough of mind and body to do that. But I'm sticking to it. I'm holding on to that, and by the time I die, there's no going back and changing things. You see, with death, it is case closed. We sometimes, remember when you were kids and you'd say, I, I promise, you, you promise, you swear? Oh, I swear. Well, what do you swear on, <laughs> right? And you come up with some interesting things when you're a kid. Or the old saying, uh, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. It's kind of morbid when you really think about it. I can't believe we said that when we were little. Uh, but hope to die, uh, because my death would then prove to you how serious I am about this promise that I'm making. You see what we, we even understood that in a way as children. The, the strongest oath language you can possibly see in scripture is when the Lord says, as the Lord liveth. Because he's swearing on his own life, he's swearing on his own eternal existence. As long as I exist, this is true. I will not change it. And so to see Joseph, through his martyrdom, saying the same, I promise this is true, that I will give my life for it. And at my death, that case is closed as far as I'm concerned. Cross my heart, hope to die, no matter what they do to me, my testament will be in force, sealed by my own life's blood. The same could be said of Hiram, who joined Joseph in the grave, the way verse 3 ends, so has his brother Hiram. In life they were not divided, and in death they were not separated. It's hard to find a better example of true loyalty than those two brothers. Uh, Hiram, who came to know of Joseph's honesty, even in childhood, and, and would do anything for his the beloved little brother. And Joseph, same thing. If you remember that when Joseph was headed west, ready to escape uh, and preserve his life and preserve the church, I'm headed to the Rocky Mountains and I'll send back for everybody and everyone will come and we'll continue to build the kingdom elsewhere. And then when he gets this letter uh, as he's on that island in the Mississippi, uh, accusing him of cowardice, worry that he's the first to flee. It's then that he says, if my life is of no value to my friends, then it's of no value to me. That's how much 
his friends meant to him. I'll sacrifice my life for their sake. But he has this conversation with Hiram. Hiram, what should we do? And Hiram just hoped in the goodness of people's hearts and said, let's just go and, and let, it, let, it, let it play out. And Joseph, understanding things better than Hiram did, said, if you go, I'll go with you, but they'll butcher us. There was this, this honoring of Hiram's perspective. You're older than I am, Joseph said to him. True, in life they were not divided, in death they were not separated. After so many stories in scripture of Cain versus Abel, or Isaac versus Ishmael, or Jacob versus Esau, or, or Nephi versus Laman, there was no Joseph versus Hiram. Those two brothers are as close as an example of, of just a, a singular soul that you could possibly ask for. Verse 4, the history continues. When Joseph went to Carthage to deliver himself up to the pretended requirements of the law. So deliver himself up. There's the self-sacrifice. There's the willing surrender to the pretended requirements of the law. This was illegal, but he submitted to it, just as Jesus did in this, this sham trial in, for Annas and Caiaphas. Two or three days previous to his assassination, we see martyrdom, now assassination, he said, I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am calm as a summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards all men. I shall die innocent, and it shall yet be said of me, he was murdered in cold blood. Yes, Joseph knew exactly what he was headed into. The shepherd was now becoming the lamb. One who was willing to offer himself to follow the example of the Lamb of God, the good shepherd himself, the best shepherd of all. Joseph knew who he had followed throughout his life, and his conscience towards God was clear. His conscience towards men as well. His would be a murder in cold blood, and he knew it. And yet he went. There's a beautiful story told by a woman who was a young girl at the time of the martyrdom. She said, well, the last time I saw the prophet, he was on his way to Carthage jail. They stopped at the house of Brother Rosecrans. We were on the porch and could hear every word he said. One sentence I well remember. After bidding goodbye, he said to Brother Rosecrans, If I never see you again, or if I never come back, remember that I love you. This went through me like electricity, this girl said. I went in the house and threw myself on the bed and wept like a whipped child. And why this grief for a person I had never spoken to in my life? I could not tell. I knew he was a servant of God and could only think of the danger he was in and how deeply he felt it. He did feel that danger, but he also felt his own innocence, trusted himself to God. Could the Laws and the Fosters and the Higbees say the same thing about the the Nauvoo Expositor that they'd published, especially seeing the aftermath of what it brought, did they still feel justified in what they had done? Could, could Thomas Four, the governor of Illinois, say that his conscience was void of offense towards God and all men? After the, in the aftermath of what he had failed to do to protect the saints. Verse 4 then ends with another nod to scripture. I can't say it enough. Look at the martyrdom through the lens of Scripture, and you'll never read Scripture the same again. You'll understand its infinite value because of the, the price that was paid to, to give it to us. The same morning, after Hiram had made ready to go, shall it be said to the slaughter? Yes, for so it was. He read the following paragraph near the close of the twelfth chapter of Ether in the Book of Mormon and turn down the leaf upon it. I love that it was Ether and not First Nephi. Yes, this is post-Isaiah chapters. Uh, Hiram knew his Book of Mormon well. As we talked in section 84 about the church being under condemnation for treating lightly what they had received in the Book of Mormon, Hiram Smith was not guilty of that. Neither was Joseph. And to me, there's something powerful about the book that, that precipitated their martyrdom also helped prepare them for it. The world was up in arms that someone would have the gall to, to add scripture to the Bible. And yet, as they were facing the, the, the fire, 
they turned to that exact book and turned down the page. What does the end of Ether 12 say? And it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord that he would give unto the Gentiles grace, that they might have charity. That's exactly what Hiram was praying for. On that Mississippi River island, Joseph, let's go back and just trust to the mercy of people. Let's trust to the justice of the courts, if there is any. Let's trust to the, the humanity, even of our enemies. Hiram's prayer was more like Moroni's prayer here. Please bless the Gentiles with grace so they have charity, so that they'll be kind in their judgment of this book that we are writing. That, that was why Moroni brought this up at the end of Ether 12. Uh, if you remember his father's words at the end of Moroni chapter 7, that charity is a gift that God gives upon all those who diligently seek him. That if God has enough grace to give people the gift of charity, that's what changes a heart. And that's what, that's what Hiram was praying for. Heavenly Father, through thy grace, please bless our enemies. We are going into their hands. This is the lamb going to the wolf and praying that the wolf will be able to lie down together. This is millennial peace we're praying for. Well, they were still far from the millennium, even despite all the work they were doing to try to usher it in and prepare the world for that second coming. Well, how does the Lord respond to Moroni? And how does the Lord respond to Hiram and Joseph? Ether 12 goes on. And it came to pass that the Lord said unto me, If they have not charity, it mattereth not unto thee. Thou hast been faithful. Wherefore thy garments shall be made clean. Now that was not the answer that Moroni was hoping for. And it certainly wasn't the answer that Hiram was praying for either. Don't worry about their charity or lack thereof. Just worry about your faithfulness. Don't worry about people's reactions. Only worry about your actions. Do what you can. And then let the chips fall where they may. What they do to you means nothing compared to what you choose to do yourself. Moroni, you've been faithful. Joseph, Hiram, you've been faithful. Your garments have been made clean. Notice that. It's not that, and your garments have always been clean. No, we have so many canonized catastrophes in the Doctrine and Covenants of Joseph being chewed out by the Lord. And he always repented and was forgiven. His garments shall be made clean. Cleansed through the blood of the Lamb. Moroni then goes on, and because thou hast seen thy weakness, thou shalt be made strong. Now that's Ether 12 as well, right? That God can take weak things and, be, and make them strong unto you. That was good reassurance for for one of the Book of Mormon's compilers in ancient Moroni, but also for its translator in these days. Your, your weak things will be made strong, even unto the sitting down in the place which I have prepared in the mansions of my father. That's the promise. And now the verse continues, I bid farewell unto the Gentiles, yea, and also unto my brethren whom I love, until we shall meet before the judgment seat of Christ, where all men shall know that my garments are not spotted with your blood. Talk about a prophetic passage. Could Hiram have found any verse more applicable to the situation he found himself in? As he was studying scripture the very morning that they headed off to Carthage. Talk about daily devotion and nothing getting in the way of it. My garments are not spotted with your blood, that sounds like Jacob who shook his garments before the Nephites saying, the ball's now in your court. I have cried repentance. Well, the same could be said of Joseph and Hiram. We have done what God commanded us to do. And now I can bid farewell to all those whom I love. And that was Joseph's repeated message on his way from Nauvoo to Carthage, extending his love to the people that mattered so much to him. But in Carthage, that life came to an end. The last line of verse 5, the testators are now dead and their testament is in force. Case closed, penned down. We can trust their words. Verse 6, Hiram Smith was 44 years old in February 1844 and Joseph Smith was 38 in December 1843, which made Joseph 38 and a half by the time of that June martyrdom. If you can't remember 38 and a half, just find your way to Sharon, Windsor County, Vermont, 
And there in these beautiful rolling hills is the birthplace of Joseph Smith, complete with an obelisk, kind of a, a miniature Washington monument, an obelisk that happens to reach 38 and a half feet in the air, uh, one foot for each year of the prophet's life. It is a sacred place. Uh, when I first went to Sharon, I wasn't expecting much because, well, Joseph didn't really do anything there. <laughs> Let's honor Lucy Mack Smith <laughs> for her sacrifice. But being there in those oh, peaceful surroundings, there is such, it is hallowed ground. And the same can be said of, of Carthage Jail, that where Joseph's life began and where it ended 38 and a half years later. Those, those, that is sacred space sanctified by the life that, that was lived between those bookends. John Taylor continues, Henceforward their names will be classed among the martyrs of religion, and the reader in every nation will be reminded, and now we're back to the scriptural ministry, that the Book of Mormon and this Book of Doctrine and Covenants of the Church cost the best blood of the 19th century to bring them forth for the salvation of a ruined world. Think about that last phrase, to bring them forth for salvation. That's what we saw back in 2 Nephi 3, this prophecy of Joseph of, of Egypt. He will bring forth this thing, and it will bring forth salvation. Or even in 2 Nephi chapter 29, it talks about a Bible, a Bible. We have a Bible, we don't need any other. And then he says, oh yeah, but are you grateful for who brought the Bible forth to you? Do you remember the labors and the pains and the travails of the Jews and their diligence in bringing forth salvation unto you? That's all mother imagery of labor and travail and pain to bring forth new life. And that's the sense I get there in verse 6 of all that it cost Joseph, his labor and pain and travail, to bring forth salvation to a ruined world. All that we saw, the gathering of Israel in order to build temples, the, the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, the truth in the Book of Mormon, it cost the best blood of the 19th century. And we could add the best blood of a lot of centuries leading up to that as we see Book of Mormon history unfold. If it costs that of them, what are we willing to pay to bring this scriptural truth into our own lives? I pray that it won't be blood, but will it be sweat and tears? Will it be time and attention? Will it be sacrifice and focus as we study, as we ponder, as we try to live these doctrines? It is for the salvation of a ruined world, and we can participate in that salvation. The way he ends this verse, If the fire can scathe a green tree, for the glory of God, how easy it will burn up the dry trees to purify the vineyard of corruption. Understand what John Taylor's saying there? Joseph Smith was a green tree. His roots went deep into living water. And it brought that living water not only into him, but into a ruined world that was desperate for that. And yet even he was sacrificed. Even his life was cut short by the, the ruined world he was trying to save. If that's true of a green tree, then imagine what will happen to the dry trees. The ones that refuse the kind of living water that Joseph Smith's ministry was making so available to them. How will we respond to our trials as compared to the way Joseph responded to his? Do we have enough living water to become green trees? Or will we burn up as we are in the refiner's fire in these last days? For Joseph and for Hiram, they lived for glory. They died for glory. Glory is their eternal reward. Their priorities didn't change when things got hard. They lived for God's glory. It was the cause of Christ that they gave the, their lives to and, and their deaths for. From age to age shall their names go down to posterity as gems for the sanctified. Gems, precious jewels that are formed under intense heat and pressure. Back in section 101, when the saints were going through their own refiner's fire in Missouri, the Lord promised to own them. They shall be mine in that day when I shall come to make up my jewels. Well, Joseph and Hiram were definitely jewels, gems for the sanctified. 
Verse 7 then, they were innocent of any crime, as they had often been proved before, and were only confined in jail by the conspiracy of traitors and wicked men. Such an ironic phrase, since Joseph was accused of treason there in Carthage, to make sure that he couldn't go back and get out of their hands, accused of wickedness all throughout his life. No, he was guilty of neither of those charges, but those that attacked him were guilty of both. Their innocent blood on the floor of Carthage is a broad seal affixed to Mormonism that cannot be rejected by any court on earth. By the way, nice that John Taylor puts Mormonism in quotes, since he knows that that's not the name we chose for ourselves, nor the name that the Lord affixed to his church and kingdom. That's just the derogatory nickname that others have given us. But on that name, even that derogatory nickname, is affixed a seal that this laughing stock is actually worth living and dying for. What else? This innocent blood is on the escutcheon, or the, the seal, of the state of Illinois, with the broken faith of the state as pledged by the governor. When W.W. W. Phelps first wrote the hymn, Praise to the Man, in the aftermath of the martyrdom, uh, it's been softened with time. Now we sing, long shall his blood, that innocent blood John Taylor keeps referring to, which was shed by assassins, plead unto heaven while the earth lauds his fame. Well, the way Phelps first wrote it, it was long shall his blood, which was shed by assassins, stain Illinois while the earth lauds his fame. Oh, there was, there was some strong feelings against the state of Illinois and against its, its governor, that just like the governor of Missouri had done nothing to preserve the religious rights of, of a portion of his constituents. He cared more about what other people thought than what the saints deserved legally. Well, whatever that blood is staining, it is a witness to the truth of the everlasting gospel that all the world cannot impeach. Their innocent blood is on the banner of liberty. It's on the Magna Carta of the United States. Remember, John Taylor was born in England and converted in Canada, and then came to the United States. It, it seems fitting that he would refer to the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution as the Magna Carta of the United States, kind of this oldest source of, of liberty, of freedom, of, of dignity, of humanity, and yet it is now stained by the blood of someone that that Magna Carta, that Constitution, was meant to protect. I mean, John Taylor was bold along those lines. At one point, he caught wind, he was going to give a public sermon, he got wind that people were there to tar him and feather him as soon as he was done with his sermon. And other saints were like, get out of here, and we'll, we'll cover for you, and that way you'll be safe. And he's like, whatever. He goes up, and he starts to, to preach. And as part of his sermon, he preaches about American independence. And this is with his British accent, okay? And he's speaking to these, these descendants of, of the patriots and comparing what their fathers died for. And then he calls them out. It says, I understand that some of you are planning to, to tar and feather me for my religious beliefs after I'm done with this sermon. Really? Is that what your fathers died for and fought for, for against my fathers in England? Is that the boon you've received from their heart's blood? Well, if so, then you have a willing victim to be laid on the altar of liberty. And he tears open his, his vest to expose his chest and says, then bring it on, ye shades of the venerable patriots. You have a willing victim. Tar me, feather me. Whew, and nobody did a thing. Well, <laughs> no wonder he had the courage to go to, Joseph, go to Carthage jail with Joseph Smith. No wonder he had the courage to stand up to opposition the rest of his life. Uh, John Taylor was, was tough as nails. And here he is bringing up the failed faith of government the failed faith of the, of the founding fathers that gave their lives, pledged their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor to be able to defend liberty, including religious liberty. What a stain upon the Constitution was the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. No wonder Taylor called that blood an ambassador for the religion of Jesus Christ that will touch the hearts of honest men among all nations. There is something about innocent victimage that can call forth pity and concern on the level of public opinion. Remember that was what caused the, or facilitated the conversion of Oliver Cowdery's older brother? Was him catching wind of all the persecution the saints were suffering in Missouri? 
I mean, that was Gandhi's plan. That was Martin Luther King Jr.'s plan. If we can be innocent victims, if we can prove that right is on our side, then public opinion can shift in our defense. That's the Lord's law on war. That's his just war theory, right? Turn enough cheeks and eventually it becomes obvious that, you're, that you don't deserve what you're suffering. And innocent blood, innocent blood, innocent blood that keeps getting mentioned in verse 7 is a message to the world that it's worth investigating what this innocent blood was shed for. And, and it has opened hearts. The last mention of innocent blood then ends this chapter. And their innocent blood with the innocent blood of all the martyrs under the altar that John saw will cry unto the Lord of hosts till he avenges that blood on the earth. Amen. With that, he shifts from a nod to Hebrews about blood sealing the testimony of the testator to a nod to the book of Revelation. As, he's walking, as John walks you through the, the seven seals, and the first four are symbolized by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but the fifth seal, the thousand years that stretches from the time of Jesus on through the first millennium of, post, of Christian history, is symbolized by an altar with the blood of the martyrs beneath it. Well, I guess it wasn't confined to the first century A.D. Because here, as the sixth seal is coming to a close, Joseph and Hiram add their martyr's blood to that pool of blood that has collected beneath the altar of the ancients. The way it's described in Revelation 6, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Oh, there it is again, the word of God, scriptural ministries, scriptural saints, martyrs for the message, slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, Remember section 133, robes of reminding red? Well, these are now robes of reminding white. Reminding people that this blood that was shed was innocent. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Fascinating phrase. You ancient martyrs, rest a while. Vengeance is mine, the Lord says. I will repay, but not quite yet. There are yet martyrs' crowns to be given to subsequent saints. You're not alone in this. There's still yet room around this altar. And until other martyrs join you, rest a while. Remember that phrase that Joseph Smith used as he is conferring apostolic keys upon the Quorum of the Twelve. As he'd said to them just three months before his death, I roll the burden and responsibility of leading this church off from my shoulders onto yours. Now round up your shoulders and stand under it like men, for the Lord is going to let me rest a while. Well, Joseph did rest a while, but there was no rest for a weary Brigham Young who, who led the saints through the aftermath of the martyrdom who ensured the peace of the Nauvoo Legion rather than ransacking Carthage and Warsaw and anywhere else. He's the one that saw the temple to completion and made sure that the saints could be endowed with power from on high before they headed west under Brigham's command, his leadership. It, I don't know if the church could have survived without the steady and strong leadership of Brigham Young. The, the newspapers around Illinois and elsewhere had headlines like Mormonism is dead, announcing the death of the church, not just the death of the prophet. The saints wondered, where do we go from here? We honestly thought that Brigham was, excuse me, that Joseph Smith was going to usher in the millennium. Well, the work he laid out definitely was enough to do that. But the work outlived him and Brigham outlived him, which means that Brigham would have to, to lead the saints through this next chapter. For us, we simply turn a page in the Doctrine and Covenants. But for the early saints to turn that page in the history of the church required an incredible amount of faith on their part. 
That same John Taylor we've been listening to in section 135 said this about the, the martyrdom. I felt a dull, lonely, sickening sensation. It seemed as though there was a void or vacuum in the great field of human existence to me and a dark, gloomy chasm in the kingdom that we were left alone. Oh, how lonely was that feeling. How cold, barren, and desolate. In the midst of difficulties, he, Joseph Smith, was always the first in motion. In critical positions, his counsel was always sought. As our prophet, he approached our God and obtained for us his will. But now our prophet, our counselor, our general, our leader was gone. And amid the fiery ordeal that we then had to pass through, we were left alone without his aid and as our future guide for things spiritual or temporal and for all things pertaining to this world or the next, he had spoken for the last time on earth. I mentioned last week that section 133 was supposed to be the final section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the, the appendix, the bookend on this dispensation's revelation. Well, we snuck in 134 as a PS. This is how we deal with church and state issues. Fittingly, we should include section 135 as a PPS announcing the end of the ministry of Joseph Smith. But I am so grateful for a section 136 that, that proves that the work does go on, that inspiration continues, that, Joseph, that, that this dispensation was not a one prophet uh, beginning and end, but rather rolling forth the kingdom of God that would eventually rise triumphant. And that next stage would take place under the direction of Brigham Young. He was a very different man than Joseph. At one point he said, much of Joseph's policy in temporal things was different from my ideas of the way to manage them. Well, he did the best he could, and I do the best I can. There is a different voice in section 136, and it's Brigham Young's voice. We should expect that. If God speaks unto man according to their language, that they may come to an understanding, section 1 said that, 2 Nephi 31 says that, then of course there's going to be different fingerprints on section 136 than what we see in all these revelations leading up to it. But you still sense the voice of God behind the human, the, the human writing, and that would have been incredibly comforting to the saints. In history, we can read about the mantle experience where, Joseph, where Brigham preaches in Nauvoo after the martyrdom and people, it sounds like Joseph and it looks like Joseph and it feels like Joseph. And there's just a sense that the mantle has passed. It's, gone, it, it's fallen from Elijah as he's caught up to heaven and fallen upon the shoulders of Elisha. And there are so many parallels between Elisha's ministry and Elijah's. We'll see all that next year in the Old Testament. But same thing here with Brigham Young. So much of what Brigham Young is famous for are things that he learned from Joseph Smith. And he said it so, he said so. Don't think of me as the great colonizer of the West. I just watched Joseph Smith build cities, great cities as we saw in section 135. Don't think of me leading the saints westward as some new endeavor. I watched Joseph Smith lead Zion's camp westward and then back eastward and I was following him and learning through the process. Well, even learning how to receive revelation, learning how to speak for God, I'm not surprised that we don't have more of these kinds of revelations because in some ways what Joseph laid out for us is enough to, to usher in the millennium and get us to that final day. We're still trying to catch back up to Joseph as far as the vision he rolled out. But to have at least this one revelation canonized to me just speaks to that continuation that the baton has been passed and we have another runner who is sprinting forward under the direction of God. God still is at the helm, no matter who the mortal leader might be. So listen for God's word in section 136, verse 1. This is the word and will of the Lord concerning the camp of Israel in their journeyings to the west. By now, the saints are already in modern-day Nebraska. Uh, it wasn't Nebraska yet. This was Native American territory at the time. The saints had been driven out of, of Nauvoo, uh, they crossed a frozen Mississippi. Long They had hoped to be able to wait until the spring so that there would be grazing land for the cattle as they all headed west. But the mobs didn't care so much about that, and so they had to leave early. Uh, crossing Iowa, which they thought would ha go pretty quickly. They left in 1846. They planned on getting to Salt Lake, or what would someday become Salt Lake. 
1846. But Iowa was so wet and so muddy and such a slow slog. There were days that you would work all day to make, to make uh, progress. And by the end of a long day with mud up to the, up to the axle, you would look back and you could still see where you camped the night before. You want to talk about demoralizing. Some days after a full day's work, they only meant went a mile. It took them longer to cross Iowa that year than it took them to cross uh, Nebraska and Wyoming and part of Utah uh, the, year, the year following. So now we celebrate the days of 47 when the saints had hoped to celebrate the days of 46. They get to this part, realize there's no hope for us to get into the Rocky Mountains this year before the snows set in. And so let's set up camp, the camp of Israel, and call it winter quarters since we're going to quarter here for the winter. Now, the word and will that comes is unlike the will of any other pioneer company. Compare the Latter-day Saints Exodus West to the the, people, the California Gold Rush or the, the Oregon Trail. And that was the will of man wanting to get rich. This is the word and will of God wanting to sanctify his saints. Verse 2, the revelation really begins. Let all the people of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then a phrase that I'd never noticed until an outsider, a non-member, pointed it out just a few weeks ago. Let all the people of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and those who journey with them be organized into companies with a covenant and promise to keep all the commandments and statutes of the Lord our God. All my life, I've only focused on the end of that verse, that God's house is a house of order. So, of course, the camp of Israel is going to need to be organized. And nobody could organize things quite as well as Brigham Young. He was that was one of his gifts, and it was a gift that was so needed in the church at this time period. And of course, it ends with the need for a covenant and promise to keep the commandments of God. Any group on the move is going to need to be organized and obedient and, and structured. Uh, think about the military operations of a Zion's camp or of a Mormon battalion. They've, they've already left by this time period. Uh, and so there went some discipline and some organization and some order. Well, we've got to learn to, to obey, to be structured. It's actually interesting that just as Lehi's family is about to head off into the wilderness, they've already left Jerusalem, but they stayed in the Valley of Lemuel for a while, right? And they went back to get the brass plates. They went back to get the, the Ishmael's family. But right before they're about to break camp and head off for their next eight years of journeying, there's, it's when Lehi discovers the Leahona right outside his tent. And it's the Leahona that's going to guide them through their wilderness journeys. But go back to 1 Nephi 16 where they discover the Leahona and then rewind just a verse or two. And the focus is on obedience. Where Nephi says that my father and I have kept every word of command that God has given us. It's like we checked off the boxes and we've, kept, we've obeyed every rule. And then the Lord's like, okay, good. You have, learned, you have mastered the iron rod with all its fixed commandments. You're now ready to graduate to the Liahona, which will then guide you with all its complexity and nuance through a wilderness toward your promised land. As the saints are pursuing this journey through the wilderness to their promised land, the Lord is giving them a Liahona in section 136. But he begins with a reminder of the need for iron rod obedience. Keep the commandments. But as I mentioned that phrase, those who journey with them, Elder Holland has a new best friend. <laughs> He's got a lot of friends. He's so full of love. He's room for everybody there. But he made uh, an incredible friend in Andrew Teal, who is a wonderful, just a celestial soul. He is a chaplain and lecturer in theology at Pembroke College at Oxford University in England. And, and their relationship developed through some interfaith work that they've been doing. And uh, Elder Holland has been to Oxford and at, at, at brother, brother, he feels like a brother, uh, at uh, Reverend Dr. Teal's uh, invitation. And Dr. Teal is now at BYU as a visiting scholar. He just gave a, a devotional address at BYU about building a beloved community. And as one who has spent 
oh, the last decade or so doing a lot of work on an interfaith dialogue. I don't know if I can think of a better example of, of honoring and, and being open to the beliefs of others as what I saw in that beautiful address by Reverend Dr. Teal. Uh, such a, a deep and compassionate heart. No wonder he and Elder Holland get along so well. But as he's spending this year at BYU as a visiting scholar, as he's here in the, among, in the cities of the saints, he spoke so genuinely, so sincerely, and so compassionately. I mean, you want to talk about, you want to talk about holy envy. Uh, it was dripping out of every word. It was so beautiful as he's quoting Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants and teachings of Joseph Smith and honoring the community that he finds himself in, even though he's not a member of it, even though he doesn't share all of our beliefs. There, there are reasons for our differences, and he would be the first to admit it, but there is so much commonality to rejoice in. And so when he pointed out section 136, verse 2, and said that the Spirit had helped point that verse out to him, talking about these people of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, on their journey towards Zion, but also including those who journey with them. Those not of our faith, but still of God's fold. Those that we can't call brother and sister within the church, but are brothers and sisters within the family of God. I want to be more like Elder Holland, and I want to be more like, like Reverend Teal. Just feeling, go, I'll, I'll, I'll try to put the, if I remember, I'll try, uh, to put the, the link in the, in the video description. Because listening to that talk, or just Google Andrew Teal BYU, beloved community, it'll be there, and it is a masterpiece. Uh, I hope that we can be kinder to those who journey with us. That's part of the word and will of God. Now, verse 3, let the companies be organized with captains of hundreds, captains of fifties, captains of tens, with a president and his two counselors at their head, under the direction of the twelve apostles. This sounds a lot like Jethro's counsel to Moses. You can't do this all yourself. You're going to have to learn to delegate. And as we're trying to gather all of Zion uh, from Illinois to an uncharted desert in the west, it's going to be all hands on deck, and we're going to need everyone helping one another. And so captains of hundreds, fifties, tens, the presidency over them, all under the direction of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Those, that last phrase is key. Since there have been splinter groups, since people are wondering, where do we go from here? It's so simple for us now because we've had m multiple passings of prophets and new prophets and presidents called to take their place. But this was the first time. It had never been done before. And so how do you continue moving the kingdom forward? Well, that clarification, it's under the direction of the 12. Now, verse 4, this shall be our covenant, that we will walk in all the ordinances of the Lord. That's we've, we've mastered the, the iron rod. We're ready to move forward with the liahona. We will obey. Verse 5, let each company provide themselves with all the teams, wagons, provisions, clothing, and other necessaries for the journey that they can. You're going to need as much as you can squeeze into the box of a covered wagon or a, or a handcart. Your world will be in there. Make sure you are providing yourself with everything you can, every necessary for the journey. If you think about the journey that we are in, engaged in through our wilderness toward our celestial promised land, are we providing ourselves with the necessaries for the journey? Or are we filling up our handcart or our covered wagon with things that take up space but aren't bringing us closer to our goal? I worry sometimes about the use of our time or the spending of our money. And, and there's only so much space in a covered wagon. There's only, it's only so much weight that you can push across the plains. So be wise and think about the necessaries, not just the luxuries, the necessaries for the journey, spiritually speaking, most of all. Verse 6, when the companies are organized, let them go to with their might to prepare for those who are to tarry. Now, if you were a, a California pioneer or an Oregon pioneer, you'd probably stop with the first sentence. 
yeah, go get organized and go to with your might because there's a gold awaiting. There's land. There's, there's, there's riches ahead. But for the saints, well, but what about what's behind? There's people behind. A pioneer is one who goes forward, but are they preparing for the ones who go behind? We talk about the trailblazers. Well, that suggests that there's other people that will be following that same trail. What about them? If we don't do the first half, then there's nothing for them to follow. But if we don't do the second half, then we haven't helped those followers that are coming behind. Yes, we must go to with our might, but go to to do what? To prepare for those who are to tarry. I am so grateful for those who have gone before me to blaze the trail, who have had thoughts of those that would come behind, like the rest of us. So what does that entail? Verse 7, let every company with their captains and presidents decide how many can go next spring. Then choose out a sufficient number of able-bodied and expert men to take teams, seeds, farming utensils, to go as pioneers to prepare for putting in spring crops. If this is winter quarters, then who's going to put in the spring crops? And where are we going to spend our time and, and settle down? The companies are going to start. Interesting that he allows for each company to decide for themselves. Uh, Brigham Young's always described as this incredibly powerful central leader. But he's also allowing for that kind of on the individual case. What does your company feel about this? What, how many able-bodied men can your company provide? How many need, do you need for yourself? What's your sufficient number? That's going to be individualized. What can you handle? But think it through. Choose out a sufficient number. Make sure they're able-bodied, as expert as they possibly can be, because they're the ones that are going to have to go forward. But going forward, looking behind. Preparing for those that are behind them by putting in spring crops. Can you imagine planting crops that you would never harvest? Can you imagine building shelters you would never live in? That's what the, the Mormon pioneers were trying to do. This is a process. We talked about it in section 133, gathering out people from Babylon and those that are commanded to tarry so that they can help other people get out. Well, here's some tarrying behind to build shelters and to plow fields and to plant crops and then head forward. They would have gotten to, the, to their promised land a lot faster if they weren't building and planting for people that would come behind. But knowing that there would be those that followed, they did exactly that. Verse 8, let each company bear an equal proportion. That sounds like Zion, of one heart, one mind. We're all taking care of each other. Yes, each company can decide in verse 7, but each company needs to be equal with one another in their overall load. So let each company bear an equal proportion according to the dividend of their property. In taking the poor, the widows, the fatherless, and the families of those who have gone into the army, that's Mormon battalion, that the cries of the widow and the fatherless come not up into the ears of the Lord against this people. Again, we see evidence of caring for other people. So often when there's some kind of mad scramble, gold rush, or, or land rush, just trying to get dibs on things. Remember the saints themselves struggle with that? We're going to get to Zion first, even before we've become Zion along the way. Well, that's got to be changed. It's got to be fixed. So plant the crops, but even along the way, share your property so that every poor, every widow, every fatherless, every family left behind by, by the Mormon battalion can make it. Because believe me, God has sensitive ears. And he can hear the cries of people that tend to get forgotten, widows, fatherless, people that can't provide for themselves. You see that next year throughout the Old Testament. God has a special spot in his heart where he remembers the forgotten, that he includes the marginalized, that he supports those that have no other support but he. But here he's calling upon his saints to make sure they're supporting them as well. If you are a widow and have no husband, well, then you're the church, and Christ is your husband. If you're an orphan and have no father, then God is your heavenly father and is providing fathers and mothers all around you here on earth to be able to build you up. 
In verse 9, let each company prepare houses and fields for raising grain for those who are to remain behind this season. This is the will of the Lord concerning his people. Are we building things for posterity? Are we constructing things that we will leave behind? Are we leaving the world better than we found it? That's what the Lord is asking of us. In verse 10, let every man use all his influence and property to remove this people to the place where the Lord shall locate a stake of Zion. Yes, we're leaving a stake, multiple stakes behind, but where we will yet build stakes ahead. And so move forward. Don't look back. This is another one of those Lot's wife experiences like we saw in section 133. Don't look back to Nauvoo. There are things f further ahead. There is a, a desert that is yet to blossom as the rose. And so we have work to do. And don't just use your property. The property was mentioned back in verse 8. Here in 10, that property is combined with influence. And if there's not temporal things that you can give, are there spiritual things you can give? Can you influence people towards Zion? 11, if ye do this with a pure heart in all faithfulness, ye shall be blessed. You shall be blessed in your flocks and in your herds and in your fields and in your houses and in your families. All that you're sacrificing, building things you won't use, the Lord will pay you back. Believe me, he, he has high interest rates as far as what he is willing to reward us for. The Malachi measure, windows of heaven opened and pouring out blessings more than we could possibly handle. In verse 12, Ezra T. Benson and Erastus Snow organized one company. In 13, Orson Pratt and Wilfred Woodruff another. In 14, Amasa Lyman and George A. Smith organized another company. And in 15, there still will be appointed presidents and captains of hundreds and of fifties and of tens. We've got to get organized and move forward. Verse 16, let my servants that have been appointed go and teach this, my will, to the saints, that they may be ready to go to a land of peace. We've had enough conflict, enough persecution in every state of the union we've been in. And so let us go to a land of peace where no one will bother us. At least that's the hope. Don't just go and do it. Go and teach it so those that are behind can continue the process. Every group of subsequent pioneers will both be blessed by those who went before, but then continue to pay it forward by preparing for those that are behind. Are we, have we learned similar lessons? Verse 17, go thy way and do as I have told you. Fear not thine enemies, they're behind you. They shall not have power to stop my work. And though you've felt stopped, Nauvoo is no longer yours. The Nauvoo temple is no longer yours. You're going to pass north of Missouri, but eventually Missouri will be far to your east as you're, you're in a place far, far from Zion. And yet, what's the reassurance? Verse 18 would have come as such a blessing to them. Zion shall be redeemed in mine own due time. Don't worry. Your enemies can't stop the work, right? Joseph Smith's great statement, no unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. You will, you will be farther away from Missouri than you've ever been. But Zion will be redeemed. Just trust me. I will look behind you. You don't have to look back. Just move forward. Verse 19, if any man shall seek to build up himself and seeketh not my counsel, he shall have no power and his folly shall be made manifest. So don't build up yourself. It's all about others. And don't seek your counsel. It's all about God's counsel. There's the first great commandments. If you love God more than self, if you love neighbor as self, then, then you'll find your way to Zion. You'll be able to navigate life along the way. Verse 20, seek ye, keep all your pledges one with another, covet not that which is thy brother's. We're going to have to learn to get along on this trip, and unity will be key. 21, keep yourselves from evil to take the name of the Lord in vain, for I am the Lord your God, even the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Now that's a tall order for a trek, if you've ever been on one with the youth. Who uh, can we really be one, like it says in 20? Can we really be Christ-like, like it suggests in 21? I mean, treks are hard, but watch your mouth and watch your heart and watch those around you and build them up. The, the saints on Zion's camp weren't always saintly, which is why they suffered so much. The saints crossing the, tr the trail to go to the west weren't always saintly either. 
There were times where Brigham Young said, there are days I just wish I could lie down and wait for the resurrection. We've got to be better. We have to be more unified. And thankfully, the saints got to that point. It's amazing the self-sacrifice in the, the pioneer companies. The self-sacrifice during the, the ordeal of 1857 and 58 with the Martin and Willie Handcart companies. It's amazing what people were willing to do to, to lift wherever, where they stood, to share what they had, to make sure that everyone got to the promised land or, or were buried with their heads towards Zion. It's amazing the kinds of things that took place. And then the Lord says this in 22. I am he who led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. My arm is stretched out in the last days to save my people Israel. It's as if the Lord is reassuring them. I mean, get able-bodied men, get experts, get your captains of hundreds and fifties and tens. But at the end of the day, it's not under the direction of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. It's under my direction. And this ain't my first trek. This isn't my first exodus. I brought the children of Israel out of bondage and brought them with my strong arm into their promised land. I can do the same for you. Remember how often Nephi looked back to Moses as his example. And if God can do that for Moses, then surely he can do that for us. If Brigham Young is the American Moses, as so many people have called him, then there was a God of Israel that was leading the way. In fact, a God of Israel who had two different approaches for t these two different exoduses. We talk about their similarities, and there, there were many. Uh, crossing the frozen Mississippi as if crossing a, a Red Sea on dry ground. Uh, quail coming as they first got across into Iowa, just like the, the quail or the manna from heaven. Uh, of coming to a, a desert that had a Dead Sea and a Jordan River. Uh, again, there's so many beautiful parallels, but to me what's even more fascinating are the differences between the two. The differences between ancient Israel in their exodus and modern Israel in theirs. Here's a few to consider. In ancient Israel, they were led by a pillar of fire and a cloud of smoke. They always knew where they needed to go. Whereas for the LDS pioneers, they were led mainly by inexperienced amateurs to a very poorly scouted area. In fact, some of the more experienced scouts worried, there's no way anybody can survive in the Salt Lake Valley. Ancient Israel crossed the Red Sea and the Jordan River on dry ground. Well, other than the frozen Mississippi, the saints had so many very wet river crossings. Uh, to the point, even in those freezing conditions, in some ways it would have been better if it had just been a little colder and just freeze it every time. But it was not crossing on dry ground like it had been for ancient Israel. The Israelites were fed with manna for 40 years, every day but the Sabbath, and they got a double portion of the day before, so no worries there. Whereas the pioneers, minimal rations, many of them starving along the way. Ancient Israel, thirsty? Hey Moses, can you, can you knock this rock for me? And out gushes the water. Whereas the LDS pioneers, were forced to follow the rivers, rivers that made their journey in so difficult, but I have to have a water source. Ancient Israel, this is a miracle we sometimes forget about, their clothes and their shoes never wore out until they'd reached the promised land. Can you imagine 40 years wearing the same outfit and it never wears out? That's a far cry from what the LDS pioneers went through, leaving bloody footprints in the snow, intense deprivation and suffering. Ancient Israel, once they got there, they found a land flowing with milk and honey. And the saints found a desert that was far from blossoming as the rose. In fact, when ancient Israel got into the promised land, they simply took over the territory that had already been settled by the Canaanites. Cities were already built, wells were dug, vineyards were planted. They just moved in and took over. That was not the case for the LDS pioneers who built their own cities and dug their own wells, and planted their own vineyards. And yes, slept in, in muddy dugouts and ate seagull lily bulbs uh, along the way. You see, I bring up that last one because of a passage in Joshua that was reminding Israel, as they were now in the Promised Land, of a warning that Moses had given them the generation before. 
Joshua says this, speaking for the Lord, I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them. Of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not, do ye eat. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. See what Joshua is warning them about? You didn't have to work very hard for this. God handed it all over on a silver platter. Will you still serve him? He must have remembered Moses' caution the generation before. Because back in Deuteronomy 6, Moses had said, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, but then here, which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. You see what he's getting at? It's the silver platter problem. It's God is going to give you things that you didn't have to work for. And here's his caution. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. That's the problem that comes when things come too easily. It's not that we bite the hand that feeds us. It's that we completely ignore that there was a hand behind the food. We think that it was us. Or we just think, oh, of course it's supposed to be this easy. When no, it's only easy because somebody else made it hard on themselves. I'm, I'm fascinated by that passage in Joshua and Deuteronomy. And that reminder, that caution, beware lest ye forget the Lord. Because guess what happened in ancient Israel? They did forget. But what happened with the saints that followed in the pathway of those Mormon pioneers? They didn't forget. Why? Because our pioneer ancestors didn't leave us that option. It was so hard for them. They couldn't forget. And I am amazed by the differences then. That the Lord, it's like the Willie and Martin Hancock companies that said, well, I know it's late in the season, but God's in charge of the weather. And he can make, he can, he can, stay the heavens and, and, and postpone the winter and make sure we get to our promised land. Well, they were right about God controlling the weather. But instead of made, making it easier, he actually made it harder. That winter was worse, and it came earlier than usual. But what did those pioneers in the handcart companies, in the Willie and Martins, what did, what did they say afterwards? We came to know God in our extremity. And that could be said of all the, the pioneers. It was harder for them than for ancient Israel. And thanks be to God for that added difficulty. If you are in the, a, a place that you are still trying to build a city that no one else has before, if you are seeking for places to dig wells because you, you can't find any that are, already, that are already dug, then trust that God is making something of you in the process. And trust that the difficulties will bear dividends. The kind that we will never forget the Lord our God. In verse 23, he goes back to reminding them of the kind of camp of Israel it needs to be. Cease to contend one with another. Cease to speak evil one of another. That's hard to do on a trek. 24, cease drunkenness and let your words tend to edifying one another. Don't try to drown out the difficulties through drink. Face them. Embrace them. Learn that there are better ways to cope with these kinds of challenges. If we will turn to the Lord, if we will edify one another, mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort, build, lift where you stand, make sure everyone gets out or comes along, edify one another every step of the way. 25, if thou borrowest of thy neighbor, thou shalt restore that which thou hast borrowed. If thou canst not repay, then go straightway and tell thy neighbor, lest he condemn thee. I mean, if it's all hands on deck and we're just doing the best we can and we're gathering as many of the necessaries for the journey as we can, but then you start the journey and you realize, oh, I didn't have all the necessaries. Uh, does anybody have something that can fix my wagon wheel? Or does anybody brought an extra blanket? Or anyone have any extra food? No wonder we're going to need to borrow, but also to repay. We're going to try to make this as easy on everyone as we can. If I can't repay them, if I've lost what I borrowed, or if it all ran out, or it broke on my watch, then 
go and apologize. Go and tell them this is going to require our best behavior, our most Christian living. I remember going to a family reunion at a time when all of the kids were just starting to have grandkids. And we realized in pretty cr uh, close quarters that once one baby woke up in the middle of the night, then it was going to wake up all the other babies. This was going to be intense. Uh, when all the grandkids were really, really little. That, that was, those were some, some interesting family reunions. And I remember driving to w w the one of them with my wife and, and children that were either going to wake up everybody else or be woken up by them. And just saying to my wife, this is going to be interesting. We've got to decide in advance to, to lose ourselves in order to find ourselves. To not to care so much about our things and is it my turn to do this or I want to be out and, or, and how come, can't somebody else watch our kids? I remember at one point my wife said, so and so really wants to do some, such and such, can you watch the kids? Ours and theirs. And I just smiled and I said, of course, I'm lost. And she's like, what do you mean I'm lost? Remember that's our, that was our mantra for this? To lose yourself in order to find yourself? So, hey, I'm lost. And, and in some ways, what the Lord is telling all these saints to do on their journey is to go get lost. Now, you don't want to get lost literally on the plane somewhere, but go get lost along the, uh, along the way by losing yourself in service to others. It's amazing how much more enjoyable treks become, or road trips, or family reunions, or life in a community or a family when you choose to lose yourself. So, saints of Israel, get lost then and now. Of course, 26 speaks of getting lost literally. If thou shalt find that which thy neighbor has lost, thou shalt make diligent search till thou shalt deliver it to him again. Again, thinking more of others than of self. You might find something and think, sweet, I, I could have used this. Well, so could the person who actually brought it. That's probably why they brought it in the first place. They're out diligently searching for it. Well, you should be out diligently searching for them to make sure it can return to its real owner. And then 27, thou shalt be diligent in preserving what thou hast, that thou mayest be a wise steward, for it is the free gift of the Lord thy God, and thou art his steward. See, in some ways, 27 offsets 26. It's like, why did it get lost in the first place? Well, maybe they weren't a wise steward. Maybe they weren't taking care of it. Well, 27, don't be that guy. Make sure you're taking care of your own things. I mean, that's the pioneer ethic, right? Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. I'm so grateful that that's, that was the mantra of my ancestors. I still try to live that way. And it's so much easier to live that way when you realize that it's stewardship instead of ownership. See, if I own it, then I only have myself to blame if I ruin it or waste it or whatever. But it was mine to begin with. I can do whatever I want. Uh, no, if it belongs to the Lord and consecration, if it belongs to all of us, then I should be as careful as I can with my possessions so I have more to share with others coming behind. Or others that perhaps weren't as careful with theirs. See, I love how 27 compensates for 26. Or the two of them come together. That if I can live 27, then I don't, I'm not forcing other people to live 26. But if I slip into 26 and lose something that, well, then I'm grateful for others that were wiser stewards than me and will help me in my stewardship, even as they've, they've fully magnified their own. You see, the, the LDS pioneers, it's incredible what they were able to pull off along the way, which then prepared them to build Zion once they got here. At one point, Brigham Young said, I did not think there had ever been a body of people since the days of Enoch. So there's the ultimate Zion. Placed under the same unpleasant circumstances that this people have been, when there was so little grumbling, and I was satisfied that the Lord was pleased with the majority of the camp of Israel. Well, the majority at least. There's always going to be a few uh, Lamans and Lemuels that make it a little harder. But we're even going to try to bring them along and help them change along the way. That's the kind of camp of Israel we're hoping to develop. It actually reminds me of a principle I've taught elsewhere. I call it the wander, wander, die principle. It comes from ancient Israel, where it doesn't take 40 years to get from Egypt to Israel. It took them about six months. Uh, well, what's with all the other time that they spent? It's because they crossed the Jordan, spied out the promised land, and were stoked about the, the, the milk and honey, but scared to death of the size of the enemies that they would have to conquer. 
And so when those 12 spies came back, 10 of them had a, had a faithless, fearful report. And only two, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, we can do this if God is with us, if we're with him. Well, unfortunately, the Israelites paid more attention to the fear of the ten than the faith of the two. And God said, then fine. I'm eternal. I can wait. So why don't you, for the next 39 years, give or take, wander, wander, die, wander, die. Until your generation has passed and a new one has risen up in your place that I pray will have more faith than fear. Oh, by the way, Joshua and Caleb, you can stick around. Sure enough, 40 years later, it's got to be deja vu for them. As they're back at the Jordan River and two old timers are looking at all this risen generation wondering, are we ready to do this? Because we were ready 40 years ago. By the way, the Lord says even to them, I'm still eternal. I can still wait. So if you still lack the faith to go into Zion, then we could do another round of wander, wander, die, wander, die if we have to. That rising generation was like, no, 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 we're good, we're good. <laughs> we're sick and tired of our wanderings. And so crossing the Jordan River sounds really good to us. And with faith, they moved forward. This early LDS pioneer group was trying to do the same. I hope that we are acting in faith. I hope that we are becoming the kind of camp of Israel God intends for us. Or what will happen, we will wander, wander, die, wander, die as well will still be waiting to redeem Zion, which someday will be redeemed, he promised. Uh, we'll still be waiting for our own city of Enoch because we're not quite Zion yet. Well, back to section 136, verse 28, if thou art merry, which suggests that, yeah, you'll even have some good times along the trail. And even if circumstances don't make you merry automatically, you can choose to be. Attitude is everything here. And if thou art merry, show it. Let your face know it. Praise the Lord with singing, with music, with dancing, with a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Can you imagine how tired you'd be after a long day of trekking? And the last thing you'd want to do is stay on your feet and start stomping them. And yet that was part of the solution. It's part of what got them through their hard times was taking advantage of opportunities to be merry. And to do it in, in joy, in, in singing, in dancing. This is far from the dour Methodism of Brigham Young's youth. <laughs> for, the, for him, that would have taken some adjustment. Like, wow, no, this is actually really good. This is divine. This is inspired. So go be merry. Now, 29, it's not always going to be easy to do that. So if thou art sorrowful, what should we do then? Call on the Lord thy God with supplication that your souls may be joyful. Notice he's not even praying for a different circumstance. They're praying for a different attitude. Uh, this, this winter might still be just as cold. And that mountain might be just as steep. And this trek might be just as long. And this food just as, as non-existent. But if I call on God, then perhaps my attitude can change. Can he soften my heart so that I go from verse 29 back to verse 28? And I actually feel like dancing when the fiddles get pulled out tonight. There's something, I'll admit this, Joseph Smith once said that he had a native cheery temperament. And I've always been grateful that I was blessed with the same kind of mental wiring. But the more I have worked and, and lived with and loved those with mental health challenges, the more, I'll put it this way, the less I take any credit for a native cheery temperament. That native cheery temperament has taken some hits at times. And I'm just grateful that there are those that have had to push themselves, that, that joy doesn't come naturally, that they have to call upon the, the Lord their God with supplication for their souls to be joyful. And sometimes that blessing comes and sometimes it doesn't. And they just keep pushing their hand carts forward. For any of you who are suffering through mental illness, those with anxiety or with depression or with any other ailment that makes life and makes joy hard to come by, if being sorrowful is your default position mentally and emotionally, then my heart goes out to you. And I encourage you to call upon God with supplication that your souls may be joyful to thank him when that blessing is granted 
and to not give up on him when it isn't. Someday, Christ will wipe away every tear from every eye. That's the promise of Revelation. But in the meantime, I hope we can wipe each other's tears away. I hope we can support one another, willing to share in their sorrows in hopes that they can share in our joys. Someday we'll all feel of that. Verse 30, he says what he said before, Fear not thine enemies, for they are in mine hands. I will do my pleasure with them. So again, don't look in your rearview mirror. Don't feel like you have to get vengeance, because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Don't fear them. Don't, don't hate them. Just pray for them. Leave behind any of those ill feelings. Leave it in Nauvoo. Go to a new promised land. And perhaps verse 31 will help you with that attitude. My people must be tried in all things, that they may be prepared to receive the glory that I have for them, even the glory of Zion. He that will not bear chastisement is not worthy of my kingdom. So think about all that you've been through. It's not that I, I caused it, but I did allow it to happen because I knew what it would make of you, that you would be tried in the refiner's fire. But look at how refined you are. You are better prepared than ever to receive the glory of Zion. Your heart's been broken, but that's what opens it up, ready to be filled. If you can't handle that, then you can't handle what I'm trying to give you. Remember the phrase in section 132, the eternal weight of glory? Well, that's going to require broad shoulders and a strong back. And the best way to get you to that point is by sending you for a day in the gym, not a day at the day spa. Your life is going to be hard because I'm trying to strengthen you. And if you can't handle that, then you won't handle this. When my kids were little, we used to say to them, if you're not big enough to share, then you're not big enough to have. When it was hard for them to share their, their treats or their toys or whatever. It's like, oh, you're, oh, I'm so sorry. You're not big enough to share it. Then you must not be big enough to have it in the first place. I think the Lord is hinting similarly there. If you're not big enough to bear chastisement, then you're not big enough to handle the weight of glory I am trying to put upon those shoulders. So be open to the hard times. They're preparing you for the best times. Verse 32, Let him that is ignorant learn wisdom by humbling himself and calling upon the Lord his God, that his eyes may be opened that he may see and his ears opened that he may hear. It makes you wonder what we're ignorant of in verse 32. Are we ignorant of our weakness to the point we need to come unto him so he can show them to us and then help those weak things become strong? Are we ignorant of what the real necessaries for the journey were? And therefore we fall short and we fall down and we have to humble ourselves and ask for someone else's help. Are we ignorant of our own blind spots? Well, by definition, of course we are. But if we'll humble ourselves then, of course we'll learn wisdom. God will introduce us to it. Our, our, our neighbors and friends will introduce it to us. We'll have eyes to see those blind spots. We'll have ears to hear the instruction that, that we needed and didn't know that we did. Verse 33, For my spirit is sent forth unto the world to enlighten the humble and contrite, and to the condemnation of the ungodly. Again, I'm going to take care of the enemies. Let Leave them in my hands. But in your hands, be humble. I will enlighten you if you do. 34, thy brethren have rejected you and your testimony, even the nation that has driven you out. No love lost there, by the way, with the United States. Oh, they treasured the Declaration of Independence and cherished the Constitution. They learned earlier that it was inspired of God, right? But they didn't miss those who had fallen short in their duty to uphold it. Their, the nation had rejected them and their testimony. The nation had slain the prophets. The saints saw the Civil War through that lens safe in their mountain fortress as north and south was tearing themselves apart. That's what 35 suggests. Now cometh the day of their calamity, even the days of sorrow, like a woman that is taken in travail. And their sorrow shall be great unless they speedily repent, yea, very speedily. Only in that way could the calamity of the civil war be averted. 36, they're getting their due because they killed the prophets and them that were sent unto them, and they have shed innocent blood, which crieth from the ground against them. This echoes what John Taylor said at the end of section 135. Their innocent blood, their innocent blood, their innocent blood, the innocent blood of the martyrs at the altar. 
Uh, this is crying from the ground against them. In some ways, the Civil War can be compared to 3rd Nephi 8 and then 9 and 10, preparing for the coming of Christ in chapter 11. Uh, this, the destruction that took place in the Americas, the Lord tells them it was to hide the, the wicked and to silence the cries of the, of the prophets and saints that were slain by them. Same thing was happening here in U.S. history. Then verse 37, Therefore marvel not at these things. Don't be shocked. Peter called trials, don't consider them a strange thing. Uh, this is what we signed up for. Okay, So marvel not at these things. Marvel not at your persecution, your opposition. Marvel not at the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram. Marvel not because ye are not yet pure. Think of the refiner's fire. Ye cannot yet bear my glory. That's why I'm broadening the shoulders and strengthening the back. But ye shall behold it if ye are faithful in keeping all my words that I have given unto you. From the days of Adam to Abraham, from Abraham to Moses, from Moses to Jesus and his apostles, from Jesus and his apostles to Joseph Smith, whom I did call upon by mine angels, mine ministering servants, by mine own voice out of the heavens to bring forth my work. I mean, talk about a rapid review of the dispensations, right? Uh, he didn't mention Enoch or Noah, but that's included in that first gap from Adam to Abraham. But Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Joseph, all that God has taught, all the glory he has tried to bestow upon his faithful children, this is the dispensation of the fullness of times. We are trying to build the ultimate Zion, the new Jerusalem. So don't marvel that our generation would need to be purified and put through the refiner's fire. He's trying to prepare us to prepare the world for the coming of Christ. In verse 38, this foundation he, Joseph, did lay and was faithful, and I took him to myself. 39, many have marveled because of his death. So not just the marveling over their own trials, but marveling that God would allow trials to escalate to the point of a martyred prophet. But don't marvel at that either. He says in 39, it was needful that he should seal his testimony with his blood, that he might be honored and the wicked might be condemned. Wow, the, the honor of martyrdom, as well as a just punishment for those that brought it about. But don't marvel, don't be surprised. It was needful. This is what echoes the 135, the, the test or the book of Hebrews. The testament is in force because the testator is dead. And after all, verse 40, have I not delivered you from your enemies only in that I have left the witness of my name? So the refiner's fire is never going to be uh, so intense that I'm not leaving people behind to be a witness for my name. I have delivered you from your enemies. I did not deliver Joseph, but I have delivered you. Be grateful for that and continue his work. Make sure that his testament, now in force, continues to spread across the earth. So 41, now therefore hearken, O ye people of my church, and ye elders listen together. You have received my kingdom. It's the kind of language we saw at the very beginning of the Doctrine and Covenants, hearken and listen. The kingdom is yours. Go bear it off triumphant. 42, be diligent in keeping all my commandments, lest judgments come upon you and your faith fail you and your enemies triumph over you. So no more at present. Amen and amen. I have given you enough to do. Do it. I've given you commandments to keep. Keep them. Judgments are all around you. You've escaped some I'm trying to prepare you to escape the rest. I don't want your faith to fail. Of all the things that, that we seem to lose on our journey west, sometimes it's our faith that gets lost. I wonder if we take that lost faith and tie it back into what we saw in verse 26, that if your neighbor has lost something, then make diligent search to return it to them. We're in this trek together. Here we are trying to cross a wilderness, find our way to a promised land. There are those that are captains of hundreds and fifties and tens. We are our brother's keeper. We are trying to help fortify faith so that our enemies do not triumph, so that the cause of God will triumph instead. The way verse 42 ends, no more at present. Amen and amen.
I kind of just get this sense from Brigham Young. That's plenty. We got to get going. Okay, gather the stuff, break camp, uh, put out the fires, uh, and let's start moving forward. There is work to be done. And that work would continue to be led by God. The revelation would continue to flow. No more at present doesn't say no more in future. And I am grateful to be led by, by a leader in Israel, in President Nelson, who continues to receive the word and will of God. For us, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and for any who are willing to journey with us. Section 136 is a, a beautiful continuation of God's revealing work in our day. And I am grateful for a Brigham Young who was open to receive this revelation and to continue to receive them throughout his ministry. That, that, that idea of no more for now, I remember when I was blessing my second child, the, his baby blessing, and, and he cried through most of it <laughs> to the point that uh, it was a much shorter blessing than I wanted to give him. And I just remember there just trying to you know, bounce him and <laughs> see if it would help or anything and nothing seemed to. And just feeling this, this sweet little reassurance, it's okay to give a short blessing today because it's not the last one you'll ever give your son. I am grateful for continuing revelation. I'm grateful for 42 verses that were vouchsafed to Brigham Young, but also with this gentle reassurance, this isn't the, bla the last blessing you'll receive. It's not the, the last revelation. And we'll never get to a last revelation. God continues to speak. Brothers and sisters, I just wanted to close today again with my, my testimony of prophets like Brigham Young and my testimony of a prophet like Joseph Smith and all the prophets that have followed in their, in their path. When Joseph Smith was lying on the ground in Carthage jail the night before the martyrdom, Dan Jones was there with him. Uh, and I, I guess unable to sleep, go figure, Joseph Smith turned to Dan Jones that night and just asked him, are you afraid to die? You can only imagine what was in Joseph's mind and heart at the time and just wondering, is this it for me? And Dan Jones, bless his faithful soul, said to Joseph Smith that engaged in such a cause as this, I should think that death would hold no terror. And then Joseph prophesied, you won't die. I didn't say anything about himself. You will live, and you'll live to go back to Wales and to share the gospel and to preach and build the kingdom. And that's exactly what Elder Dan Jones did. But to have that kind of faith and fortitude in this kind of cause, remember Joseph's language in section 128, go forward, brother, and on, on to the victory. This is the cause of Christ. And death or, or difficulty, trial or trek, should hold no terror for us. Parley P. Pratt wrote a poem for the Millennial Star in 1845, the year after Joseph's death. They still missed him. We're still trying to figure out what to do in Nauvoo, and do we head, what, what, where do we go from here? And Parley's answer, in a word, was forward. The way he put it in this stirring poem, he, speaking of Joseph, has organized the kingdom of God. We will extend its dominion. He has restored the fullness of the gospel. We will spread it abroad. He has laid the foundation of the temple. We will bring up the top stone with shouting. He has kindled a fire. We will fan the flame. That is the legacy of the prophet Joseph Smith and a legacy that we have inherited. He did light the fire. Will we fan the flame? Go back to that passage I referred to in 2 Nephi 3 when Joseph of Egypt says that this thing, <laughs> whatever this is, this kingdom of God upon the earth, this thing that a later Joseph, a later Joseph Jr. would bring forth, would bring salvation to the sons and daughters of God. You and I get to be involved in that. But let me add one last detail from that prophecy of Joseph of Egypt. When he says that that thing that a later Joseph will bring forth for salvation, he says that in one verse, in the verse right before it and the verse right after, he bookends that prophecy with his own faith in its fulfillment. In the verse before, he says, behold, I am sure of the fulfilling of this promise. And the verse right after, he says, I am sure of this thing. My dear friends, 
after spending the last 11 months studying words that God revealed through Joseph Smith, may I bear my testimony that I too am sure of the truthfulness of this thing. I am sure, as the Holy Ghost has confirmed to my spirit, that Joseph Smith was and is a prophet of God, that he saw the Father and the Son, that he rolled up his sleeves and moved forward the kingdom of God, that he lived great and died great with a conscience void of offense. I testify of Joseph Smith as a prophet. He, no one has taught me more about Jesus than he did. And for me to, I'll put, I'll put it this way, I don't bear my testimony of Joseph ignorantly or naively because I have read almost everything that people have said against him. But with eyes wide open to his humanity, I have a heart wider and more open to the divinity that has flowed into the world through his instrumentality. God lives. Jesus is his son and our redeemer. And Joseph is their prophet to bring their truth to the nations of the earth. I am grateful for that and am sure of this thing.